Hello, friends. It's James Lindsay. You're listening to the New Discourses podcast. And the most recent episode of the podcast was about what's actually happening in our schools. Actually, the long kind of Marxist plan to destabilize children by sexualizing them. And so groomer schools was the topic. Groomer schools one, we now have to call it because I'm going to do groomer schools two. As it turns out, in the interest of full disclosure, so I don't look like a super genius when I'm not, I've actually had these a couple of academic papers in queer theory say open tabs on my browser for like a year. And I've always kind of meant to comment on them when I was going to get into queer theory. And then immediately after I recorded the podcast about groomer school, I went back and just I remembered that they're there afterwards. And I looked and I thought, well, I really should have talked about these. And what do I do? And so now we're going to have groomer schools too as the episode of the podcast today. Uh, but it worked out because as I was reading these papers again, um, and I'm only going to talk about one of them today, actually. Uh, as I was reading these papers again, I realized I, there's just no better way to communicate that what I said in Groomer School 1, which is that there is a long-running ideological project to to groom children out of childhood innocence um, so that they can become politically moldable. And if there happens to be abuse and uh, sexual grooming and sexual abuse, both psychological and sexual abuse of children along the way, yeah, so be it. There's no better way to show that than to actually just read one of these papers. And as you know, here on the podcast, I often do these things and they run long um, to read these and, and kind of explain them. Now, this is going to be a little bit more difficult because I'm not, I, I, I'm <clears throat> fairly well versed in uh, queer theory and gender theory, but I'm not as well versed in this as I am in, say, critical theory like Marcuse and the Frankfurt School or in critical race theory. So a little bit of this is, is still in the realm of gobbledygook for me, and I don't have time, given everything else is going on right now, to go read, you know, all the way back to the 1940s, literally, at least, the long track of queer theory. And then it's kind of two big offshoots, or one of which, you know, is landed in the schools. Um, that being kind of this grooming mentality being one of its big offshoots and the other a destabilizing identity uh, in a politically actionable way. And the other being actually transhumanism, which would require me to go down the Donna Haraway um, cyborg line, which is extremely important, but tangential to my purposes today. It's extremely important to understanding what's going on with the weirdo elites, like in the World Economic Forum, as they are actually transhumanists and they want to use all of our high tech medical gear and electronics with this kind of like metaverse and eventually Neuralink or something like it, where you're plugged into the, like you literally have the internet grafted into your an internet interface grafted into your brain and you live constantly in a semi digital semi analog world uh, or even totally digital world where you you know you're in your pod you own nothing and you're happy living in the matrix um, those are kind of two veins of importance but that's not what we're doing we're doing the political grooming side and the sexual grooming side and so I'm just going to read this whole paper and kind of comment on it, as I often do here on the podcast. And this is grooming schools number two. And again, the point here is I really need you to understand that there is a, an agenda to destabilize identities. And part of the purpose and part of the practice is to, uh, to, to problematize the idea of childhood innocence. They want to destroy childhood innocence. And then the previous episode of, I guess, this now podcast series on grooming schools is that this is a program that's run at least 100 years within Marxist and neo-Marxist circles. It, in fact, is part of the cultural Marxist program that was really begun by George Lukács that get, got brought into the uh, Frankfurt School that where critical theory was devised. And so, you know, and eventually in the 60s became the, six, the sexual liberation movement um, and has kind of spiraled from there. And in the schools now, it's under the branding of comprehensive sex education frequently or uh, gender education, and it's usually uh, com uh, an included component within social-emotional learning. So this particular paper, I don't honestly know how influential this paper is. It's very representative of what I need to communicate to you, that there is, in fact, an attack on childhood innocence, the frame childhood innocence, childhood innocence out in the so-called critical constructivist way, which means the woke way, which is to say that it is socially constructed, in other words, that it's false, 
It is a contingent product of a culture, nothing to do with reality as it actually is. Um, and that it needs to be taken apart because it, uh, it through critical theory methods, because it carries with it power dynamics and reproduces the hegemonic social structure that if we understand why they wanted to attack the existence of our civilization as Marxists, it is so they can achieve communism and so they can get a functioning society out of the way and replace it with a utopia that they believe is possible if they just force it in. And in the previous podcast of this series or type, I said that George Lukács understood in 1919 that if you destabilize children's uh, children through uh, sexualizing them in schools, through literally educate sex education programs that are very similar to what we see today with the graphic depictions, you know, very many graphic novels right now with the, the full on displays, etc., um, but literally the grooming that you, uh, make them manipulable. You can actually sever the link between parent and child. You can actually make the younger generation resent and hate the older generations and the way that the existing society has been at a moral level, throw that off. And that's cultural Marxism, because then when they become sufficiently destabilized, the revolution will be able to proceed on their backs in any amount of abuse of children in the affecting of this turns out actually to be to their benefit. Uh, so they, they aren't just, they don't just ignore the fact that they're abusing children. It actually helps, um, which is grotesque. But when you're banking on utopia on the other side, as communists always are, um, it's a small price to pay from their perspective. So this paper is by uh, Hannah Dyer from Carleton University in Canada. It was I don't know if Hannah Dyer is still at Carleton University in Canada because this paper was published in 2016 in the journal titled The Global Studies of Childhood. It's a sage journal. And the title of this paper is Queer Futurity. So it's like the word future turned into a different part of speech. Queer Futurity in Childhood Innocence Beyond the Injury of Development. And this is a sick title. Futurity is kind of a complicated um, academic slash woke word that means possibilities. That's all it really means. You're looking forward to the future and you're seeing what possibilities lie within the future and you're hoping to actualize. So it's not just possibilities, it's like possibilities you hope to actualize. So queer futurity means also both within individual children, but also societally for these people. Everything has multiple meanings. Every woke word has an agenda attached to it. Queer futurity and the, and childhood innocence beyond the injury of development. And the goal is going to be to actually to deconstruct childhood innocence. I don't want to read the other paper that I mentioned, but just to give you a taste of that, I'm not going to get into this deeply. This is by uh, Julie C. Garland from Carleton University, Canada also. Um, published in 2018, so one might assume that these two uh, so-called researchers work together, these two activists work together at Carleton University in Canada. And this paper is titled Interrogating Innocence, Childhood as an Exclusionary Social Practice. And childhood's in scare quotes. Um, so there's definitely the goal to deconstruct childhood innocence as a kind of narrative. And we're going to hear this as we go through this paper. I don't know any other way to do this, except I started to read it. It was like, I wanted to find pieces to pull out and show you. And it was just like, no, I just have to read the whole thing. I just have to read the whole damn thing. It's so awful and grotesque, but at the same time, this is the nature of these stupid critical theory arguments. They're so torturous. If you just pull some little piece out, you are going to get accused first of all of not recognizing their full argument or engaging with their full argument, which is much more complex than the thing that you actually commented on. It's BS. It's just a just a maneuver that they use to pretend that they're not being criticized fairly when, in fact, they're being criticized fairly. But secondly, they also just wrap things up in such long-winded paragraphs. It's like, okay, I need to read this paragraph as I was reading through it. And I was like, no, I have to read that paragraph and this paragraph. I have to read like four paragraphs. Oh, I have to read six. And they just kept expanding. I was like, screw it. I'm just going to read the whole paper. And so again, we turn back to Queer Futurity and Childhood Innocence Beyond the Injury of Development by Hannah Dyer, published in the Global Studies of Childhood in 2016. And her abstract reads, because it is so often said that children are the future, 
queer theory's attention to and searing debates on queer futurity offer something new and important to studies of childhood. This, of course, should already give you the heebie-jeebies. That's the first sentence of the abstract. Drawing on and deepening recent attempts to meld the fields of childhood studies and queer theory, I dwell on the contradiction that results from the synchronous assumptions of the child's asexuality and proto-heterosexuality to show how emphasizing sexuality within a discussion of children's education is constructive. So that's a lot of words. I mean, I don't want to do this sentence by sentence by sentence, but we kind of have to. So I dwell on the contradiction. So, of course, we're working in a dialectical frame. This is a dialectical leftist religion. The results from the synchronous assumptions of the child's asexuality. So we're assuming that children are are pre-sexual, in fact, asexual, uh, as a result of being pre-sexual. They're not focused on sex. This has not developed yet. But she's saying that there's a cultural assumption that not only are children asexual, which she will problematize and, and argue is not quite true, but also that they are asexual yet proto-heterosexual. In other words, they're going to become heterosexuals. And there's a, an assumption that they're going to become heterosexuals. So we treat children as asexual while, in, while indoctrinating them into heterosexual and heteronormative ideology. So we treat them simultaneously, she has a contradiction there, as people who are not sexual beings, but who are being indoctrinated into a particular uh, ideology, as she thinks of it, of sex, which is heterosexuality. And so she says that the, the, the existence of this contradiction says that we what we need to do to fix this problem, as she sees it, is to emphasize sexuality within the discussion of children's education. In other words, comprehensive sex ed, as we call it today, which I just exposed in the previous podcast as the um, modern end of a uh, 100-year-long project from Marxism to deconstruct the family and the institutions of society, and it will injure children psychologically uh, severely. Uh, but that's okay because for them, because that's how they think about the world. You know, they think that everything's already injury, so we have to have this other approach. Um, she goes on, in the service of my interest in the renewal of thought concerning children's psychosexual development, I offer a critical reading of the It Gets Better social media campaign, particularly its consequent critiques and revisions. I begin with engagement of Eve, Eve Sedgwick's 1991 seminal essay on queer childhood, How to Bring Your Kids Up Gay. And then from there, trace contemporary queer theory's use of the figure of the child and consideration of the impact of innocence on childhood. So like I said, the idea, innocence here is in scare quotes. So she's going to lean on Eve Sedgwick, who is widely regarded as one of the kind of, we called them, called her one of the fairy godmothers of queer theory in cynical theories when Helen and Pluckrose and I wrote that uh, a couple of years ago. And so she's going to begin with engagement on this seminal piece of work about queer childhood and then use it to to problematize the idea that we consider children sexually innocent. And she's going to try to call into question and queer the entire um, narrative about uh, childhood innocence. And what queering means in this case is going to be alphabet. <laughs> it means alphabet. It means to sublate in the Marxian terminology, Alfhaven being the German, it means to abolish but to keep certain essential elements while lifting up to a higher ideological level. In other words, it means to transmor keep the thing and infiltrate it and transmogrify it into a uh, Marxian ideological framework. That's ultimately what it all means. And so she, but she never mentions any of that specifically. This is why it's so hard to go through this. You actually have to understand so much to understand what they're talking about. And the funny part is, is there are going to even be professionals working in this, reproducing this, writing this, that have no idea what they're even reproducing. Uh, they're just going along with the, the kind of front end of the ideology or whatever, which is, I often get criticized. Oh, these people haven't read Marcusa. Marcusa is definitely felt in this paper, by the way. I don't know if, if Hannah Dyer has read Marcusa or not, and I don't care. Because the truth is that most congregants are not pastors and most pastors are not theologians. And if you can't understand how that, that, how that works, then you don't understand what's going on. And in fact, in this case, a lot of the theologians, in fact, don't even know necessarily where the religion came from. Uh, however, we want to break the metaphor down. She goes on. Let's not digress. We're only in the abstract. 
in an effort to consider the contemporary residues of historical violence on the theories of healthy, that's in scare quotes, child development, I also consider how histories of colonialism and transatlantic slavery extend into the future and leave traces on contemporary theories of child development. So somehow we've got to attach um, colonialism and slavery, so critical race theory and post-colonial theory, to this queer theory. And as I mentioned in the previous podcast, not even thinking of this paper at the time, that's part of the project. They want to deconstruct um, kind of like national innocence or whatever, if we want to call it that, the idea that it's okay to be a member of a particular nation or history or, or culture or part of the world if you're in a dominant one. They want to take that apart and challenge it in a Marxian way that's post-colonial theory. And then they also want to take apart the idea of, of race, racial innocence. Children shouldn't be allowed to be racially innocent. They shouldn't be allowed to be politically innocent. I won't say geopolitically innocent because geopolitics means something else, but you know what I mean when I say geopolitically innocent because everybody uses the word wrong now and means it to mean politics across the global scale rather than politics have to do with geology, <laughs> which is what it really means. Um, like where oil reserves are, but uh, at any rate, geopolitically innocent, racially innocent, sexually innocent, all has to be obliterated. That And so this is tied in here. Keywords, childhood, sexuality, LGBTQ, and nation state are the keywords of this paper. So let's dive in. Eve Sedgwick, right off the bat, introduction. In 1991, Eve Sedgwick, 1991, published an essay that may be uh, said to have initiated contemporary queer theory's consideration of childhood as a site of heteronormative intervention. <sighs> I hate the language. I don't want to have to keep doing this. Um, what in the hell? So they believe that there's an overarching power dynamic in society called heteronormativity. It's been expanded to cis-heteronormativity to include the T within the LGBTQ Um or even the Q, the T and the Q both run into uh, cis heteronormativity, cis normativity aspects. And so she says there's, okay, so it says they got written in 1991. It initiated queer theory's interest in childhood, and it frames out that childhood is a site in which heteronormativity is impressing itself upon people, and therefore queer theory becomes a site in which there can be an intervention to stop that. Uh, from happening. So we're not going to impress heteronormativity, the idea that it's normal to be straight, which turns out to be true uh, in the uh, mathematically normative sense. The vast majority of the population is straight. Um, and we're going to see how, how deeply challenged that gets here. Uh, of course, the, the one of the standard moves of queer theory is to conflate normati normativity in the sense of uh, you know, bell curves and averages with normativity in the sense of morals or normative values. And so that which is the smaller, smallest part of the population or small parts of the population being outside of what's considered normal uh, expression for humans is then given a, it, it's just assumed to have a moral judgment as well. Whereas the majority of people today look at uh, gays and lesbians and bisexuals and they say, okay, probably they were born that way. I think they were. And so fine. Some people are gay, get over it. It's a small percentage of population. So it's not exactly the human normal, but there's nothing wrong with it. It was even a joke from the nineties. Not that there's anything wrong with that. And it was a Seinfeld joke. Uh, not that there's anything wrong with being part of a numerical minority that has a set of you know, proclivities or behaviors or interests that are different from everybody else's. We all have kind of understood this in kind of late liberal thought that, yeah, there's a lot of human variation and a lot of it's not morally normative, not morally relevant. You can still be a perfectly great person, even if you're outside of these kind of, you know, majority views. But no, queer theory ossifies the older view that most of us consider outdated today that uh, believes that these things are aberrations and that they're evil and all of this. It's no longer, you know, it, it denies the fact that the, that there has been broad acceptance. And in fact, it doesn't just deny the fact that there's been broad acceptance. It in fact hates the fact that there's been broad acceptance, um, because it needs queer activists. It needs, as Herbert Marcuse had it, radical outsiders who are willing to take up that revolutionary energy. And what it's afraid of is that by being brought into the moral normative range LGBT and Q or however, not Q, not Q, not Q, Q, 
LGBTQ is not normative by definition. LGBT in some or LGB in some T uh, by being brought into the normative range, say by allowing for marriage equality or whatever else or gay marriage, or however you want to phrase it, by being brought into the normative range, then Yet again, just like how capitalism stabilized the middle class and the lower class, and they stole away the working class's potential revolutionary energy, what they see as by making uh, broad acceptance movements succeeding for, say, gay rights or gay equality, uh, that you're going to stabilize the gays and you're going to take away their revolutionary energy. And if we had a colorblind society, you would stabilize the racial minorities and you would take away their revolutionary energy. That's why they have to fight these things. They hate them. They hate them. Most people don't understand that the queer theorists hate, hate, hate marriage equality. They hate anything that within the moral framing of normative brings their potential proletariat revolutionary class into the fold of broadly accepted by society. They have to keep finding more and more outsiders. You can see how reactionary and hateful a movement this woke crap is when you realize that that's what it is. It's to literally to keep keep people who are racial minorities, sexual minorities, gender minorities, etc., down and oppressed so that they can tap their revolutionary energy to make them feel alienated and exploited so they can tap their revolutionary potential. Because the thing neo-Marxism is afraid of most is that their new working class, that they, as, as Marcuse phrases it, that they just found in this co- solidarity coalition of intersectionality, this new uh, new proletariat might stabilize. In society, capitalism might stabilize them by accepting them. Oh, no. That's the thing they're afraid of. That's the thing they hate. You must understand that. And so here, though, we're talking about how it's going to intervene with children to make sure that children aren't able to grow up in a situation where acceptance, et cetera, are viewed as okay. <laughs> it's a very sick ideology because it's you have to understand. I did a podcast about this the other day with identity Marxism. You have to understand that Marxism is not about economics. It's not about anything in particular. It's not about identity politics. It's not about consumerism. It's not about economics at all. It's not about the working class. It never was about the working class. It is about achieving a revolution that reorganizes who gets to be in charge of society with the and so-called class conscious or whatever conscious, the Soviet conscious or socialist conscious Marxists in charge of everything. It is a revolutionary ideology that will use whatever tool it has to use. So for Marx's day, it was economics because industrial capitalism was rough. In our day, it's identity politics because identity is the most sensitive thing because we got a lot of the, we didn't solve the economic problems. We have some new economic problems that are really reinventions of old economic problems, but they have to move it into a frame that actually works with people the way that they resonate and where the alienation is. The point of Marxism is not to alleviate alienation, it's to exacerbate alienation so that you you can create a revolutionary force so you can get your revolution. And in neo-Marxism, it gets super, super sick because the goal is perpetual revolution. Um, so that never again, is there a stable society? And I'm going to do a podcast on this. I'm going to get to it. I've had a huge breakthrough on understanding this recently. And I want to share it with you, but it's not this podcast. We're sticking with queers, uh, queer theory and kids. Um, okay. So where did we leave off? We're two sentences in Jeez. uh, one sentence in even worse. And so it's always open season on gay kids. This is a quote from, quote, it's always open season on gay kids, end quote. The late queer theorist feminist, uh, the late queer theorist famously quipped in an article that was audaciously titled, How to Bring Your Kids Up Gay. That's Eve Sedgwick that we're talking about, in case we lost the plot. 1991 article. Sedgwick contend, how to bring your kids up gay. Think about that in light of Douglas Murray's idea that it's to make homonormativity and to demonize heteronormativity, an inversion of what is. Uh, Cedric contended that, des- quote, desire for non-gay outcome, end quote, was pervasive in how adults deal with the appearance of non-normative gender or sexual desire in childhood. So what Cedric was saying then is that the entire way that adults think about children and sexuality is that we want to achieve a non-gay outcome, which maybe in 1991 there was more to it than there is now. Um, I think acceptance has broadly been achieved. Sorry about your new working class um, Marxists, uh, but it's not working out for you. But her, her, her very cynical claim is that the, the uh, a pervasive way that adults dealt with 
children who are outside of the very masculine male attracted to female, very feminine female attracted to male um, norm, that their main motivation was don't have a gay outcome, avoid uh, avoid gay kids, a- avoid your children becoming gay. And so she goes on uh, quoting Sedgwick, advice on how to help your kids turn out gay, not to mention your students, parishioners, your therapy clients, your military sw- subordinates, Sedgwick in 2004 jested, quote, is less ubiquitous than you might think. That's an interesting list. You know, how do you help your kids turn out gay? Kids, students, parishioners, therapy clients, military subordinates. Um, She was concerned with the amount of interferences being made into young lives that aimed to straighten out their futures, was disturbed by large amounts of suicides, I would argue fairly enough, and brought the helping professions to task for their catastrophic support for beliefs that queer childhood was not viable or healthy. In How to Bring Up Your Kid, How to Bring Your Kids Up Gay, Cedric foretold of queer studies coming surge of the bitterness toward curative interventions into the emergence and sideways growth of the queer child. She explained to her reader that the 1980 edition of the diagnostic, and this is a big point that I just hit and pay attention. She explained to her reader that the 1980 edition of the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, third edition, DSM-3, the first that did not classify homosexuality as pathological fault, was erroneously celebrated as liberatory for queer subjects. So this is where you have to understand acceptance and liberation are fundamentally different. So all of a sudden what we have is the DSM no longer classifying in its third edition, 1980, no longer classifying gay as a mental disorder. Homosexuality is no longer a mental disorder according to the DSM. And this you would think is a huge milestone in progress for gay equality. LGBT equality. And she says, no, this was erroneously celebrated for that because it's not, it was celebrated as being liberatory for queer subjects. They get to be themselves now, right? We're not going to classify them as mental disorder, mentally disordered. And yet, no, it's not liberatory. She says, that's a mistake. In the same edition, Cedric pointed out, a new category was indexed, gendered identity disorder of childhood. So what we now call gender dysphoria. The establishment of gendered identity disorder of childhood as a diagnostic classification assumed the ability to detect impulses not yet organized as queer identity and realign them with heterosexuality. I would actually say cis heteronormativity would have been a better articulation of this. And how to bring up or bring your kids up gay, Cedric expressed worry for the children who are being, quote, fixed under this classification. So you can't win, you know, right? They they get a massive win in the gay acceptance and gay equality movement. And all of a sudden it was terrible. That's a terrible thing. It took away. Why? Because it took away the revolutionary energy. They're not outsiders. You can't alienate them as easily in a society that accepts them. The underlying Marcusean theory, and we live in Marcus's world, is that this will stabilize them and make them a non-revolutionary force that therefore has to be, will, will be usurped into the broader majority. It's like the extension of whiteness to Asians lately within race. Same thing. It's stabilizing and it, it, it takes away the ability to alienate and divide and conquer and, and agitate. Um, Sedgwick expressed worry for the children who are being fixed under this classification, Deborah Britzman, 2003, fondly refers to Sedgwick's loving hold on sissy boys and he-she girls when she remarks that the article is uniquely important for its submission, that it, quote, takes the loving reparation of the figure of the child's queer body who catches without reason the shadow of the mother's femininity or the father's masculinity, even if these were not the first shadings of gender offered to remind one of the chances nature can take, end quote. 25 years later, Ensuing uh, Sedgwick's foundational remarks, queer theory now includes a robust literature that, yeah, very robust, that rethinks and re inhabits the child with an attention to its queer character. After Sedgwick, queer theory has mapped numerous temporalities onto the future of the child, assurances of a better future, appeals for avoiding of the future, 
and the potential for metrics of human development that allow for sideways growth are some. The child has become both a limit and a hope for queer theory. That's sick. The child has become both a limit and a hope for queer theory. As the literature in this field has revealed, the child is a dense site of meaning for both queer sociality and alienation. You have to keep the kids queer. They can't be accepted as LGBT or even Q. They cannot be accepted. They have to be kept queer because the child has become both a limit and a hope for queer theory. The literature in this field has revealed the child is a dense site of meaning for both queer sociality and alienation. Alienation means the ability to agitate them to become a Marxist revolutionary. It is a locus of anxiety for homophobic culture because it rests on the reproduction of a heteronormative future. Queer theory is now bursting with debates about the status of the child. Talk about some groomer stuff in relation to futurity, politics, and sexual subjectivity. But the field of early childhood education largely resists learning from and carefully attending to these conversations. So now we're problematizing as a mode of, en- of as ideological entry into the field of early childhood education. You're resisting something and it's causing harm to gay people. You have to incorporate us. That's the message. The same ideological entryist move over and over and over again. We're, we're, we're going to do it again. And later in this paper, she does it again. The field of early childhood education largely resists learning from queer theory and incorporating queer theory by carefully attending to these conversations. So it's being unfairly exclusionary because why the argument will be because the innocence of the child is this broad narrative that's, that's preventing people from taking up queer things and bringing it to children, sexualizing children. So this is some sick stuff. And it reminds us the context here is we're still talking about what's happening in groomer school. Okay. Groomer government schools uh, with these people having been put in charge through uh, social emotional learning and comprehensive sex education. Okay, so now we carry on. There remains a palpable nervousness and discomfort in this field of thought and practice when childhood comes into contact with sexuality. Imagine being so divorced from humanity to think that that that's not normal. And of course, I hate normal. There remains a palpable nervousness and discomfort in this field of thought and practice when childhood comes into contact with sexuality. Yes. And they're going to claim that it's because there's this hegemonic narrative of childhood innocence that needs to be destroyed so that we can queer early childhood education. That's your kids, little kids, early childhood education. We're talking pre-K, K through three, four, maybe. We're, we're talking little kids. Got to sexualize them and look how bad you are that you're not willing to do so, that you're nervous and discomfort. You have discomfort. Have you interrogated your defensiveness? We can go into the whole white fragility style Kafka trap at that point to, again, manipulate for the point of ideological entryism into early childhood and, and then later childhood education to sexualize children. She says, despite embattled resistance, conversations about how queer and lesbian, gay, bisexual, trans, and queer LGBTQ studies might enhance childhood studies have slowly begun to emerge. Many of the arguments made in the field of childhood education concerning children's sexualities, though, tend to stabilize queerness as identity. Remember, queer means identity without an essence. So stabilizing queerness as identity, uh uh-oh, instead of preserving something, preserving something contingent, a quote, site of collective contestation, Judith Butler, uh, Bodies That Matter, 1993. And so... Judith Butler gets invoked. What is Judith Butler saying with a site of collective content contestation? No, nobody can really tell what Judith Butler is saying ever. That's not true. You can actually learn to read her. And then you're like, oh my God, can't believe she wrote that stuff. But um, what she's saying is that queer identity should not be, queerness should not in fact be stabilized as an identity at all. It's an identity without an essence. It should in fact be understood as A, something you collectivize around being outside the norm and B, a site of contestation. It is a site of revolutionary potential. It is what I'm telling you about Marxism. It doesn't care what the variable is, economics, race, queer. It doesn't care what the, the, the variable is. It's just about getting contestation so you can get to revolution. It's all it cares about. And so we have to preserve queerness. We have to induce queerness. We have to embrace queerness in young children so that they can be brought into understanding it, not in a naive way that they have a different identity that might be acceptable, but rather so that it can stay as something contingent that can be used for revolutionary potential. These people are psychotic. This is disgusting when you actually understand what they're doing. In this article, 
She writes, I move beyond commonly employed sociological techniques for securing the child's, quote, right to LGBTQ identity and assert that queer theory's growing attention to discourses of childhood offers methodological, pedagogical, and epistemological advances to the provision of care for all children. So you don't have a right to having an LGBTQ identity that you'd be recognized as, right? You don't have a, the legal right, like we're not going to discriminate via sexuality or whatever. No, 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 that's the wrong way to think about it. We need to keep thinking about methodological, pedagogical, and epistemological uh, advances in the provision for care for all children. So it's supposed to be an ongoing project. We're not going to secure rights and move on. We're not going to do the liberal thing, expand rights to a minority group and uh, protect those rights. Um, no, the, what a liberal progressive would want, we're actually going to use this to continue to make it a site of collective contestation. In other words, group-based identity politics, uh, radical revolutionary in aims, Marxian in shape. She says, my argument begins with the premise that developmental theory and its attendant model of developmentally appropriate practice, DAP, can be destructive to some children's imaginative and social capacities when not attuned to their possible queer presence and futures. Isn't that an interesting sentence? So what she's saying is that the idea that we're going to take into account developmental psychology and understand that children have a developmental arc that they follow as their brains mature, and as they experience the world going through that maturation phase that extends at least well into um, their, their 20s, beginning from, from the very beginning, we're going to say, oh, well, that's sometimes destructive. It destru it's destructive of their imaginative and social capacities unless we attune it to the possibility that they're queer in the present or that they will become queer in the future. Their possible queer presence, that's present, like present tense or present time, and futures. As many have noted, the rhetoric of innocence that envelops normative theories of childhood development has the damaging effect of reducing the child to a figure without complexity. So children are innocent. Whoops. Didn't take into account how complex they are. In particular, didn't think about how they might be queer. We didn't think about how race impacts them, blah, blah, blah. White innocence, childhood innocence, all has to be deconstructed. This is what's happening in our schools. This is what's happening in our schools. This is the purpose. Here, I help to illustrate, she says, how some of the aff affective libidinal, so emotional uh, libido based or sexual, but in the kind of Freudian sense, epistemological and political insistences on childhood innocence can injure the child's development and offer a new mode of analytical inquiry that insists upon embracing the child's queer curiosity and patterns of growth. And what we're going to find actually is that she argues that every child should be treated as though they might be queer so they can embrace the queer child, the queer, the child's queer curiosity and patterns of growth. And then the assumption is that people who are of whatever type are just going to grow into, you know, if they're heterosexual, they're going to grow into healthy heterosexuals by default. If they're queer, then they're going to be nourished and validated. So they're going to grow into more healthy queer, uh, identities, whether those are sexual identities or whether those are something else. The assumption is that you, that, that developmental psychology is irrelevant, that reality is re irrelevant and that we can actually just open up the playing field and everybody will grow up with no damage, no problems. Whereas in fact, you're destabilizing identity growth during developmentally crucial phases and actually destroying children while also opening them up to sexual grooming and abuse. This is horrifically psychologically abusive because these people are crackpots and Marxists, which are to repeat myself, but they're specifically dangerous crackpots and that they believe that the world works in a way that it very much doesn't. And then they're Marxists in the fact that they want to nourish that fact so they can create revolutionaries out of your children in schools, in government, state schools that you pay for with your tax dollars, that you should be able to trust that your, uh, you know, elected representatives, whether at the level of the state or the federal level, or even at the local level, most importantly, school board, county commission, et cetera, you should be able to trust that they're going to put the schools not into this program and they have infiltrated it completely. Forging, she says, forging more prolonged conversations between queer theory and childhood studies may deepen understandings of children's diverse educational needs and complicate assumptions that sexuality and its tendency to bleed outside the boundaries of knowable indexes of identity can easily can be easily mapped onto a predictable future. So we have no idea how people are going to grow up. We have no idea. We have no idea. So we just completely queer everything and open everything up. No stability, no boundaries, no structure, nothing. And if it causes identity disorders, well, those were queer, latent queerness that were going to come out anyway. So we've done something good. 
Drawing on, she says, and deepening recent attempts to meld the fields of childhood studies and queer studies, here I dwell on the contradiction that results from the synchronous assumptions of the child's asexuality and proto-heterosexuality, we talked about that in the abstract part, to show how emphasizing queer growth within a discussion of how children negotiate development is constructive. Let me back up one second because people will accuse me of having overspoken, possibly, where I said... um, you know, the thing about, uh, we're just going to open it all up and everything's going to be just completely fine. Um, that's, that's actually their argument. You you do have to understand that. That is actually their argument that, that to get rid of all boundaries, to get rid of all structure. And why, how do you know that? Because literally in the previous paragraph, she said that the idea of developmentally appropriate practices is a problem. Developmental psychology is a, for them, a scientific lie or a, a, a um, medicalizing lie if we want about how children actually operate and they want to act, they actually want to exist outside of reality in complete ideology and to build the children around ideology that's disconnected from reality. So I did not overspeak. I did not overspeak. You must understand they are literally rejecting the idea of developmental psychology entirely and saying, we have to just open up the field completely so that queerness is the center object and then everything will work out things being developmentally appropriate. Like for example, from what I understand, and I'm not the expert in this, but from what I understand, I read somewhere at one point that a child first separates the world into four identity categories, adult versus child, male and female. And so for a child, especially a toddler, they're very rigid. And you've, if you've dealt with children under the age of five, you've experienced even probably under the age of nine or so 10, you've experienced this man, woman, boy, girl mean a lot to a child and they are locked deep into that. This probably is not a socially constructed phenomenon. This is probably a core developmental milestone for children to start forming a sense of identity. That's the thing that these queer theorists want to attack in pre-K through government programs. You must understand how bad this is, what's going on with these people, what's being brought in under the umbrella of SEL, social emotional learning, for example, what's being brought in through the umbrellas of comprehensive sex education that are actually remodeled versions, updated, modernized versions of and postmodernized versions of um, George Lukacs' ideas about sex education, which he specifically used to undermine traditional and Christian morality in Hungary so he could have a Marxist revolution in the Eastern Bloc. You must understand how bad this is. Um, Ultimately, she says, first of all, she says, of course, this is constructive to do rather than destructive. It's a complete misunderstanding to be charitable or distorted lie about reality for ideological purposes. If she's in the know about what's really going on, it's impossible to tell. Uh, you must understand that, that how bad this is. Ultimately, she says, I suggest that queer theory's growing interest in childhood as a site of analysis could be strengthened by partnership with the sociological study of children's education, while childhood studies could be bettered by thoughtful engagement with queer theory. So again, we're twisting the ideological drive into some existing field that has value. I am, though, she says, apprehensive about queer theories of the child that do not account for its relationality and lived experience and spend time engaging with critiques of queer theory that do not account for racialization or continued legacies of colonialism. So in other words, we're going to have to think about this uh, intersectionally and wedge everything that could possibly be an identity power dynamic into the same analysis. And anything that's a queer theory of childhood that doesn't do that, that doesn't also racialize and colonialize, is failing something badly. This is the the dominant uh, mode now. This is the the intersectional sensibility having conquered all within what people what people who think they they're, they're smart are doing. The small, she says, the small but powerful and uh, and expanding body of work in which child study scholars critique their discipline for avoiding of queerness provides the groundwork for my inquiry into how and why studies of children's education have generally been more keen on securing knowledge concerning developmental stages and building professional capacities for realigning children's growths that occur along calculated horizontal and heteronormative lines. My analysis of queer childhood is profoundly indebted to this literature. So the goal here is, again, to challenge the idea that developmental psychology has it right at all. David V. Ruffalo's 2009 work, for example, is pointed in its address of the ways in which heteronormativity appears in early childhood education. Quote, the heteronormative 
underpinnings of ECE policy initiatives speak to the ways in which children are ab normalized when they are faced with the challenge to purchase slash rent collective identities that are unable to account for multiplicities of difference. The result of this is the establishment of minoritized subjectivities that are often disguised and or disqualified. So what he's saying and all that jibber jabbered where children are abnormalized. What he's saying is that we think of things in terms of being normal or abnormal, like being straight and identifying with same sex and gender uh, identity. We think of these and being we think of these things as, as as being normal. So children have that imprinted in that same moral trickery that I already discussed onto them by those assumptions. And so some children are made to feel normal, while other children are made to feel abnormal. But what's actually going on? He says to purchase and rent collective identities that are unable to account for multiple of difference. So oh, now we're all going to be boys, and we're all going to be girls, and this is what it means to be a boy. And you're going to like little girls eventually. Maybe not now. You're going to think they're gross, but eventually you're going to like them. Ver- vice versa. There's this whole like proto heterosexuality being imprinted on people. And we're not taking into account the multiplicities, the 200 possible genders and the 3000 possible sexualities. They're all fluid to one another and all, in parallel for every single possible sexuality, a romantic orientation that they talk about now. And what the, what this does is it, it forces a minority status as you, to, as a subjectivity. So you understand yourself as a, as a, as a minority and an outsider. Uh, and, um, those are, he says, disguised and or disqualified. So people hide the fact that they're gay or try to deny it in themselves or they're considered invalid by the power dynamic. So there's a lot of words. I hate these people. Like Ruffalo, she says, which by the way, it's spelled different in two spots. So I don't know the correct spelling, but she spelled it wrong in one of the two. Like Ruffalo, I'm not only concerned with the erasure of queer sexualities in settings of childhood education. So that's the part I was just talking about, but also extend this line of inquiry to assert that queer theory can more expansively help to analyze how normativity is reproduced in relation to theories of childhood. So now we have theories of childhood and she's saying they're going to reproduce normativity, whether that's heteronormativity, cis normativity, or whatever other uh, normativity. Normativity is, is, again, way that they blur the idea that something that is um, considered uh, you know, major normal because it's the majority of what happens. It's normal for people to be straight. It's normal for people to have the same sex and, and gender uh, identity. Um, that's normal. Most people have that. Just a straight statistical statement, right? It's within many standard deviations of the the general bell curve, or at least a few standard deviations of the, of the bell curve of human experience. Uh, that gets a moral dimension mixed into it with a normativity. What normative means that there's a moral component to understanding that which is normal versus that which is abnormal. And like I said, we've already, we're stabilizing as, you know, they have to go after the gays now, especially the gay men because we've normal and lesbians because we've normalized homosexuality enough where we don't, we're not bothered by the fact that as Helen and I put it in cynical theory, some people are gay, get over it, uh, is the you know, progressive liberal mindset. And I mean, progressive in the healthy sense, not in the formal. I know it means something formal as a movement. I'm saying in the sense it believes that we're, we're actually making progress on these issues. Um, so <laughs> it's, it's just so frustrating. Um, let's just go ahead. Despite advances in conjoining LGBTQ studies and studies of children's education, much of the research done in this area employs queer, quotes queer, as something of an identity which is knowable and measurable. Again, I told you queer means an identity without an essence. So how could it possibly be knowable or measurable? How gay are you? You know, there are large amounts of literature, she says, that takes LGBTQ teachers and parents as its subjects of inquiry. I am interested in these subjectivities, of course, but also suggest that the queer methodological approach to child development and education can more generally disrupt teleological, teleologically constructed narratives of growth that require a developmental sequence which culminates in normalcy. So what she's now saying in a lot of words is that we're looking at developmental psychology and we're saying, yeah, there's a purpose to how humans develop. And at the end of this purpose, if we do, if we meet the developmental milestones, if we stay within the developmental framework, if we are age appropriate and how we approach quite things like, say, sex and sexuality and relationship, then you can come out with a normal 
adult, a healthy, normal adult. Now, of course, they would say that healthy and normal are social constructs that are used to exclude people who fall outside of them. It's all power dynamics. It's all critical constructivism for them. This is nonsense. There is a normal range for human beings, and there is a range within normal that can be considered healthy. And those are ideal states. They, again, deny that reality. And I fully recognize that if you fall outside of the um, the most common ranges, if you end up as a sexual or gender minority or whatever, that life is more challenging for you in navigating these. And I understand that there are also steps we could take to increase legitimate acceptance. We've already heard that they don't want acceptance. They don't want acceptance. They want radicalized subjectivities. <laughs> they want people to understand themselves as alienated. And they want to complain about everything in the system as saying that that's the thing. So here it's developmental psychology. And she says, you know, there's a teleologically constructed narrative. There's a purpose to, to, to the development of children and how we approach developmental psychology for, for most children. There's a purpose to that. And we want to disrupt that, she says. No, actually what we want to do is we want to figure out how to expand it to a, a appropriately account for the largest number of kids possible. We don't actually want to disrupt it. This idea of a constructed narrative of growth that require a developmental sequence, which culminates in normalcy. This is just a phrasing of a conspiracy theory about how we raise kids. Um, queer uh, social conspiracy theory that nobody knows they're involved in. Queer, she says, as an identity that names and makes some people sexually desire, desire socially legible has helped in making important sociological studies of sexuality and homophobia as they relate to the child's education. Queer theory, though, has offered also offered a theoretical method of analyzing constitutive discourses of normalcy. So we've got to make, yeah. Applying queer methods of analysis to studies of childhood, she says, can help to queer the rhetoric of innocence that constrains all children. So now we're getting to where innocence comes into the picture, and that's what you must understand of what they're trying to destroy in, in schools with this stuff. Applying queer methods of analysis to studies of childhood can help to queer the rhetoric of innocence that constrains all children and help to refuse attempts to calculate the child's future before it has the opportunity to explore a desire. This, of course, echoes Marcusa. The heteronymous interests enter into the mind, and they prevent you from knowing your servitude uh, before you even can possibly experience it. And so now it's, well, there are queer kids, and by uh, trying to use regular developmental psychology and regular approaches in particular that we're not going to sexualize children. That's what she actually means by attacking developmental psychology that's not developmentally appropriate to sexualize children. Um, she's saying, well, that's going to, you know, the, the, she says that, that um, the rhetoric of innocence constrains all children because it constrains some of them uh, and then refuses to attempt to calculate the child's future before it has the opportunity to explore desire. So the child hasn't even had a chance yet to figure out how queer they are. And then you're going to stick these narratives of development onto them by like that we can't explore sexuality at four years old or six years old. And they haven't even had the chance yet to find out if they, how queer they are yet. And so that's a terrible injustice. Later, she says, I engage with Andrea Smith's 2010 response to Edelman in order to, to demonstrate the uneven distribution of innocence in children. Some children are more innocent than others. Why? Because the ones who are screwed over by the power dynamic are less innocent. They have to reckon with the with with things being unfair, whereas other people get to rest in ignorance or in innocence longer, which is a form of privilege. It's exactly the same narrative that they say that white people, as a form of white privilege, have a white racial innocence, and they don't have to reckon with race, whereas racial minorities have race imposed upon them by the white supremacist power structure, so they have no access to that privilege. So there is a, already a uneven playing field of childhood innocence with regard to race, and now here also sex and sexuality and gender. There is, she says, a paradox that arises when the child's rights to agency and participation in the world are secured while it is suggested they are innocent and lacking complexity. I invoke this dilemma to highlight what is at stake when queer theory speaks about childhood as social construction, but forecloses a consideration of actual children. And not thinking about children's material rights, there are issues that get forgotten. As I write in Canada, I'm considering, for example, the history of residential schools and their devastating effects on children's lives is just one issue that might be elided or repressed when queer theory evades recognition of how the preservation of innocence in the name of rights has not protected all children equally. So now this is parallels in critical race theory and instruction where rights are said to be alienating. Why? Because they're not applied equally. 
I can insult people racially using my First Amendment rights in the United States. For example, I could use a racial epithet or slur or call somebody a name or insult them. And then I could say, hey, First Amendment, I have a right to free speech. Deal with it. And because there's a power dynamic involved that they can't retaliate in kind. And so uh, the preservation of, in that case, um, racism, but here the preservation of an idea that children are innocent when they're not equally innocent because of power dynamics. Uh, doesn't protect people equally. Therefore, rights are said to be alienating. And the, the invoking the idea of children's rights of queer theory only focuses on the rights of sexual minority children and gender minority children. It only focuses on achieving their rights, uh, securing their rights, equalizing their rights. Then it misses something more important, which is that there's a power dynamic in place. It's a constant same Marxian thing. It's, they, they're literally obsessives on this one idea that there's always some secret power dynamic that's ruining certain people's lives. So we have to upend the entire social order and give them all the power in order to fix it. And again, these are your children that they're doing this to. In service of my interest, you cannot lose sight in this paper that she's talking about early childhood development. She's talking about early childhood education. That's what she's targeting, early childhood education, and for the purpose of sexualizing them. That's what's going on here. In the service of my interest in the renewal of thought concerning children's psychosexual development, this article later engages in a reading of the 2010 It Gets Better social media campaign. If you remember, it gets better. That's, you know, telling young gay kids, don't kill yourself. It gets better. You're going to grow up. You're going to understand yourself better. You're going to understand things will get better. It will get better. Don't kill yourself at 13 while you're trying to wrestle with this. It gets better. So we're, we're going to engage in a reading of that. In other words, we're going to problematize it and say that it was a terrible idea because it wasn't queer enough. Emphasizing what studies of children's education can learn from the debates it caused, which the debates are the ginned up fake queer debates um, around it to ideologically manipulate something that was probably very net beneficial in the acceptance movement, which I think is generally good. The campaign and its consequent critiques and revisions by stupid queer theorists and its provocation to theories of queer temporality offer much to the field of childhood studies. I'm just going to say, no, they don't. To grow up queerly, it demonstrates, is a painful experience in a culture that does not validate your difference. So the message itself of it gets better means growing up queer is painful. Well, um, we can acknowledge that it might actually be harder and, and different. We can also acknowledge that there are steps to take. I already said that. Um, but she's going to manipulate the idea. To grow up queerly, it demonstrates, is a painful experience in a culture that does not validate your difference. The key word there is validate. Mm, validate, validate me, you know, it's so entitled. Both the campaign and its critics point out that there's not enough done to clear a path for children and youth to develop queer identifications and affective attachments, meaning emotional attachments. Further, it gets better in the expansive analysis it has spawned exhibit that queer temporality is extremely important to a consideration of how to survive education when it does not nurture your desire. So kind of two things to say here. We're going to Alf Haven, it gets better to turn it into a queer project. So we're going to abolish it while keeping some of its essential elements and sublating it into Marxist bullshit, uh, where it might've been something liberal and beneficial. It was from a guy named Dan Savage, who is ultimately a liberal, um, minded guy, liberal roots. And now we're going to have to turn it into a Marxist queer thing. That's one thing to say. The second is what is this queer temporality? And that's the idea. How does time affect the idea of queerness? So you grow up gay. It's hard for you as a kid, but it gets better. That means later it's better, but now it's bad. There's a temporal dimension to experiencing growing up as queer. And so now we're going to have to bring queer temporality into the analysis so that we can understand how that damage, um, is being done has a temporal dimension to it that in a sense the idea of it gets better even accepts the idea that it's going to be bad for you as a child and therefore we now have to rethink all of childhood education okay so the next that's the introduction the next section queering the child's innocence they get right to it they don't mess around or she doesn't mess around because it is so often said that children are the future queer theories attention to and searing debates on queer futurity and the, its reconceptualization of the stability of sexual and gendered subjectivity offer something new and important to the studies of childhood education informed by queer theory my use of quote queer is not only meant to register a child's potential desire for same-sex relations or LGBTQ identity, but also gestures toward more expansive ways to account for children's deviances from normativity. So what we're looking for isn't just gay acceptance. 
It's definitely not, not to understand an LGBTQ identity and understand oneself as such, but no, we have to actually understand deviances from normativity. That's what queer theory is really about, getting away from the normal. In fact, making good that which gets away from the normal, making bad that which maintains the normal, because that's a power dynamic that must be disrupted and dismantled. That's the mentality here. My critique, she says, is not only concerned with the violent impacts of homophobia on queer children, but also suggests more broadly that queer theory offers childhood studies a critical methodology that can help loosen the parameters of normative development so that a deeper and more capacious theory of children's sex, sexual education can be built. That's what I said earlier. We're going to open it up to, basically, there's a Saturday Night Live skit back in the day. It was quite funny. Sex Ed Vincent, sex education. You can look it up. And his whole thing is, you know, to see these really kind of, he's this weird little guy. He describes himself as a sex ed enthusiast. And the joke is, is that weird? Who's to say? Is that weird? Who's to say? And I can kind of do his voice. Is that weird? Who's to say? You know, sex ed Vincent. Uh, I'm a sex education enthusiast. Uh, so there's this whole skit though, and he's just doing like really kind of grotesque things like peeing in a birth paper birthday hat, pouring it on somebody's back, collecting it in a second hat, drinking it or doing something. So somebody gets off on it. Is that weird? Who's to say? Then the, the, I think it's a perfect expression of kind of postmodernism where it dips into queer theory because it's the idea that there's no position from which you could say something is weird. That's the mentality that they want to bring into your children. There's no position to, to which you could say that something is abnormal or not even a good idea. You have to be completely open-ended just in case you have some sexual, and I will say deviant, in the child. And in fact, not only that, you have to encourage and validate this just in case it's there latent and it's not willing to come out on its own because of the prevailing power dynamic. You have to encourage this kind of weirdoness. Uh, this is sexual grooming is the words for this uh, because of the logic that there's no position one could ex accept that's not a power dynamic reifying position that says that's weird or that's unhealthy or that's damaging, that's developmentally inappropriate. They're saying it's all up for grabs. Yet again, a reminder, this is what they're doing to your children. This is what they're doing to your children in government schools that you pay for with your tax dollars in violation of your trust that you get to put in a state institution that has no business doing any of this. And it's a 100 year long Marxist program to destabilize the parent child relationship and, this, and, the, and the, the child's own sense of identity. So important to understand that. My staging, she says, of a conversation between childhood studies and queer theory. This, by the way, she's mentioned that like three times. The goal is to turn childhood education into queer studies adapted to children. That's what it is. The goal is to colonize like a virus childhood education, early childhood education, and turn it into an arm of queer theory. That's her objective. My staging of a conversation between childhood studies and queer theory is not a cynical acquiescence, she says, to queer negativity surrounding the future, the figure of the capital C child, nor is it a reinvestment in the child as a blank space under which, on which to write uncomplicated resistance to homophobia. Hope and other positive affectivities associated with childhood are not always naive or unthoughtful romanticizations of the child. I call into being a conversation between two fields of thought, often deemed at, deemed at odds, in order to invite questions about the embodied vulnerabilities, educational impacts, neurological developments, and, neg and narrative conventions of childhood innocence. I hope to inspire sociological and educational theorists of childhood to insist upon a future of radical hope, that's Marxism, Marxism the hope for liberation, hope for communism, and a possibility for the child who feels the weight of of queer wanting. So like I said, this is just a attempt in the usual uh, academic leftist style to take over a field of study, early childhood education and education in general and psychology, uh, developmental psychology, and turn them into arms of queer theory. It's exactly what I just said. I employ, quote, queer to both A, classify sexuality, and B, reference deviance from cultural norms. I don't know how many times I have to say that before people will believe me that that's what they mean by it, but let me just read it from her again. I employ, quote, queer to both A, classify sexuality, and B, reference deviance from cultural norms. Thus, children who self-identify or are identified with LGBTQ culture may be considered, quote, queer, but queer childhood should not be constrained to identificatory regimes 
in other words, categorizing, or an assumption of the stability of sex and gender, because everything has to be fluid enough for grabs in queer theory. It's an identity without an essence, and it's all fluid, and it all moves, and it all changes, and you are definitely not going to be able to developmentally appropriately understand who you are, so you're going to be a destabilized, politically and psychologically manipulable person who's also going to be easily groomed into sexual abuse, and that's your children that they're doing this to. I suggest that the queer contours of childhood are the child's desires that refuse to grow up toward normative ways of being an adult, and therefore also the residual adult desire to play and to be creative. Now, I have to like pop over here to another window, and if I can find this window, I didn't think I was going to do this, so now I actually have to do this. Um, this echoes uh, this echoes Marcuse exactly. What does Marcuse say in S. Hand Liberation from 1969? talking about making the universities radical. He says, um, the educational demands thus drive the movement beyond the universities into the streets, the slums, the community, and the driving force of Marcuse's movement and the driving force is the refusal to grow up, to mature, to perform efficiently and normally in and for a society, in and for a society which compels the vast majority of the population to earn their living in stupid, inhuman, and unnecessary jobs, which conducts its booming business on the back of the ghetto slums and internal and external colonialism, which is infested with violence and repression while demanding obedience and compliance from the victims of violence and repression, which in order to sustain the profitable productivity on which its hierarchy depends, it utilizes the vast resources for waste, destruction, and ever more methodological creation of conformist needs and satisfactions. And the driving force is refusal to grow up, to mature, to perform efficiently and normally in and for a society. And here, what do we read? Uh, I suggest that the queer contours of childhood are the child's desires that refuse to grow up toward normative ways of being an adult, and therefore also the residual adult desire to play and to be creative. That's Marcusa reproduced, essay and liberation, sexual liberation movement that he spawned. Here it is, Queer Theory 2016. It's exactly the same mentality, literally just taken out of the consumerist economy, stuck into the queer sexual uh, identity economy. In this sense, she says, I borrow from queer theories. She doesn't mention Marcusa, does she? I borrow from queer theories insistence that queerness is that which undoes identity, not which holds it together. It's an identity without an essence. Queerness is that which undoes identity. And this is supposed to be developmentally appropriate for your children who have to grow up and establish a stable sense of identity of who they are and who they're going to be as adults. I borrow from queer theories insistence that queerness is that which undoes identity because identity itself is a problem for these people. If you don't, if somebody can't figure out who they are, they have all kinds of problems. It's very easy to say that those problems came from the existing structure and don't you hate it. If you destabilize somebody so they don't know who they are, they're easily pushed around. They're easily manipulated. They're easily radicalized. They're easily pulled into your stupid cult. That's what they're doing to your children in government schools. I'm not interested, she says, in only promoting queer as a category of identity that promises social cohesion. Rather, I'm thinking with Dinah George's 2013 notion of queer affects as the return of memory and the desire discarded for its ability to undo social identity. So there's a platonic you, a self that exists only in the metaverse that you pos can't possibly understand until you start to undo the socially imposed, socialized identity that you're performing. That's the queer theory that you are performing an identity that society has told you you have to be. So if you're a boy, you have to grow up to be masculine. If you're a girl, you have to grow up to be feminine, but you're not actually being those things. You're performing those, and you're only performing those to get social acceptance because society told you you had to do it. You have to pretend this role, and thus for queer theorists, gender identity comes in gender, and thus gender identity come into existence, and they are fictions that actually do a violence to you as a form of categorizing you into an identity. So queer affects as the return of memory, kind of your primordial state of being and desire discarded for its ability to undo social identity. Queer affect for Georges is what agitates our ability to fully know ourselves and its presence is a result of memory, fantasy, and loss discarded because it is difficult to bear. This is what they're doing to your children in government schools. In this formulation, Queer is not what makes us recognizable to the other. 
It is what undoes us and what here can work to undo the innocent child. Can you believe this is in print? This is what they're doing to your children in government schools. Adults, for example, sometimes find it difficult to bear the child's aggression and negative emotional responses because these reactions are often in excess of narratives of childhood innocence. Children's rights are vehemently asserted in the field of child studies, but the child's negative affects, such as hate and aggression, often result, uh, often a result of insecurity and vulnerability, are generally under-theorized. I call these affects queer. Hate and aggression are queer emotional responses. Hate and aggression. This is what they're doing to your children in government schools. I call these affects queer in order to show how complicated the interior and social world of the child can be. They're not just innocent, they're angry, they hate, they're aggressive, they have huge emotions, they, 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 can't, they can't even be properly understood because we have these narratives of childhood innocence that prevent us from understanding how a child is flipping out. This is all poppycock. Like, literally, it doesn't even match reality. Anybody who's a parent, anybody who studied children in any serious capacity knows this is all nonsense. But that's what they're saying. And it, what they've given away the game. The goal is to use the idea of sexualizing, is to use the process of sexualizing children to generate alienation, to cultivate queer affects like hate and aggression for what? For the existing society and its predecessors. This is what they're doing to your children in government schools under brand names like social emotional learning. They're teaching them to hate and be aggressive. It is a Maoist program and Lukacian program as well. I am, th that is to say, a cultural Marxist program in both cases put into practice in your children to turn them into tools to destroy society so that they can have their stupid liberation. I am thinking with queer childhood as an analytic uh, with which to show, or sorry, with which to theorize how children narrate themselves beyond trajectories of normative development that ignore the complex effects of sexuality on their undermine, or their understanding of self. So beyond referencing LGBTQ identity in children, queer childhood can rupture conventional schemas of growing up. <laughs> Herbert Marcuse, as it undoes anticipated congruency, the enforcement of strict borders between childhood and adulthood and forms of affinities convened on grounds of mutual feelings of shame and difference. Now, hold on this conventional schemas of growing up thing. Queer child can queer childhood can rupture conventional schemas of growing up. If you remember from the previous episode of this uh, grooming schools podcast series that I'm inadvertently doing, when I quoted from the end of, or for, from deep in Eros and Civilization, which is Marcuse's 1955 work, he even says, we have to eat from the tree of knowledge again to return to innocence. It's kind of a complete inversion of Genesis or whatever. Um, if you want to call it satanic, please do. Um, here we see it again. Queer childhood can rupture conventional schemas of growing up. We can return to innocence by eating from the tree of knowledge of gender, sex, and sexuality as queer theory holds it. We get back to, we get out of conventional schemas of growing up so we can stay properly, truly, critically innocent as we grow up, understanding our identities in a ruptured, destabilized sense. That's literally their argument. And this, if you don't see Marcusa in this, I can't help you after I've just given it to you. Um, so uh, let me go back to this sentence. So beyond referencing LGBTQ identity in children, it's not enough just to create stable and acceptable identities. They hate stable, acceptable identities, even Q identities and T identities. Queer childhood can rupture. It's so much worse than the so-called gay agenda. It's people have called in the past. It's so much worse than that. That thing, gay acceptance is such a beneficial thing to have achieved as a society. And here are the people who are identified as being its you know, most strident advocates actually criticizing it hard because it will stabilize those identities. If people can understand themselves, they're going to be stable. If they're stable, they're not going to be revolutionary agents, change agents as the word goes these days. So beyond referencing LGBTQ identity in children, queer childhood can rupture conventional schemas of growing up as it undoes the anticipated congruency, thus alienating them, of course, the enforcement of strict borders between childhood and adulthood. Hello, minor attracted person grooming pedophiles. We're going to rupture conventional schemas of growing up 
undue anticipated congruency, the enforcement of strict borders between childhood and adulthood, and forms affinities convened on grounds of mutual feelings of shame and difference. Queer growth does not always promise a teleological guarantee of progress, but may find pleasure in delaying the finitude and predictable foreclosures of developmental stages. This is identity crises in a box. God, it's horrible. It's so horrible. And it's dressed up in this language where if you read it, you don't, and you don't know a lot of stuff about this, the way they talk, you don't see how horrible it is. This is what they are doing to your children in government schools under brand names like social emotional learning. Get that out of schools. Put people in prison who bring this crap in. This is unbelievable child abuse, unbelievable grooming. We even see the invitation to pedophiles right there. We're going to complicate the difference between adults and children. Yeah. Why? So that gross grooming adults can have sex with children to sexualize them, to bring them into a queer identity that they didn't know was latent by abusing them sexually. It's freaking unbelievable that we've allowed this to take place because we're not willing to do the work to understand what these freaks are writing in their complicated critical theory language. My notion of queer childhood borrows heavily from Catherine von Stockton's 2009 The Queer Child or Growing Sideways in the 20th Century. Stockton shows how the belief that children are void of sexuality endures while at the same time children are assumed to be growing up and toward futures defined through heteronormative sexualities. She's actually already said this, right? And so these papers are such garbage. They just say the same thing over and over again. Stockton characterizes the queer child as a subject that hovers above and outside of histories of childhood, troubling assumptions that the child does not have, that, that, sorry, troubling assumptions that the child does not and has never fantasized queerly. Groomers. Stockton's work demonstrates that in many renditions of the child there exists, and by the way, this, this grooming is exactly the argument given when we call out these books on social media and say that these are grooming books in education, and they're inappropriate. How many thousands of people on Twitter have re replied to the people fighting back against this, the parents fighting back against the normal parents fighting back against How many of them have replied and say, if you think kids aren't sexually active, you don't even know what's going on. What? Like, what? That's exactly what we're seeing here, though. Um, troubling assumptions that the child does not and has never fantasized queerly. Stockton's work demonstrates that in many renditions of the child, there exists both the occlusion of child, children's sexuality and the tacit understanding that the child should grow up and toward heterosexuality. The gay child she proposes often has a backwards birth, that's in quotes, that solicits childhood as an adult work of reconstruction. This is a complicated way of saying that gay kids grow up thinking that they're supposed to be straight, realize eventually that they don't have to be straight, and then have to go back and rethink about how they thought about everything when they were kids. That's what she's actually saying. And so there's a colon there. When the straight adult is dead, decides that they are gay. Get that into your head. So if somebody who's gay and they grow up and they realize they're gay as an adult, maybe, or as a teenager or whatever, and they accept that fact about themselves, then the straight adult is dead. What a weird way to think about things. This is so weird. So now the, this, this, they had this whole, what she's saying is they had this whole vision for themselves growing up and they thought they were supposed to be straight and they couldn't make it work because they're not, because they're gay. And then all of a sudden they that set of beliefs about the self dies. That identity dies when the straight adult is dead. In other words, decides they are gay. The adult then reconstructs their childhood to conform with the contemporary understanding of what it must have felt like to have had a queer childhood. I'm sure some people do that, but not everybody does that. They don't necessarily go back and try to reinvent their childhood. I don't think a lot of normal people do, but those are the, we don't want normal, do we? That would be anti-queer. Stockton cites Freud's three essays on the theory of sexuality from 1905 to show how his seminal text linked the appearance of adult homosexuality, which at the time was often identified as inversion, to childhood sexuality. In Freud's foundational text on the child's possession of sexual wishes, he imparts a queer temporal schematic. The invert adult, so the queer, the, the, the gay adult, searches for the moment that, quote, a sexual impression occurred, which left a permanent after effect in the shape of a tendency to homosexuality. So what happened to me to make me gay? Working with Freud's text, Stockton writes, quote, making room, it seems, for an invert child, 
Though only through adult memory, Freud states clearly that the trait of inversion may either date back to the very beginning as far back as the subject's memory reaches. The homosexual adult then must return to childhood and rework his or her memory. Eating of the tree of knowledge, we again become innocent. The homosexual adult then must return to childhood as Eros and Civilization, Herbert Marcusa. Hello. Good to see you, Marcusa. Here in this queer theory essay from 2016 about queering little kids. And rework his or her memory of childhood to clarify the appearance of inversion. In this schematic, what is at stake is the adult's remembering of childhood, not the child's present. Stockton moves from Freud to the 20th century to show that queerness and childhood are not often are often not paired, or sorry, are not often paired. Importantly, she is not simply interested in the idea of a gay child, but also in the queerness of all childhoods. Huh? She is not simply interested in the idea of a gay child, but also in the queerness of all childhoods. So homo normativity, queer normativity, all childhoods are gay, are queer which results from the perpetual delay of reason that ensures adulthood does not come too soon. In other words, the perpetuation of childhood innocence. All children are queer. We have to create conditions in which that can be brought out. That's the operating assumption. This is what they're doing to your children in government schools under brand names like social emotional learning. They need to go to prison. Unlike the normative idea of the child whose future we must save, the queer child promises nothing. Although it may hint at contingent and provisional futures, queer childhood is that which haunts normative descriptions and temporal positionings of what it means to grow up. So we have Derrida's hauntology invoked here. Asking how the queer child... Asking how the queer child grows despite the possibility of growing towards social legibility is a generative inquiry and in, this, and in Stockton's hands reveals part of how cultures that organize themselves around theories of childhood innocence often hurt children's curiosity and imagination. So you know, we're all going to grow up, or most of you are going to be straight, all of you are going to be straight, whatever. That's going to hurt childhood innocence, or no, in, in, because of theories of childhood innocence, we're going to hold to that, and that's going to hurt childhood curiosity and imagination, queer curiosity in particular, queer imagining in particular. Addressing the child is always, as always, Jesus, addressing the child is always already queer, maybe one way of supporting their imaginative inquiries about their sexuality. Now, if you said we're thinking about the queer child who's being suppressed here and isn't able to understand themselves, you say, wait a minute, there's something there, right? Like, don't get mad about that. Maybe they do need something that helps them understand who they are. Maybe they need a grooming book in their school. But two sentences ago, or three, or whatever it is, it's literally just right here. Every child is to be seen as queer. All childhoods are queer. We're not interested, simply interested in the idea of a gay child, but also in the queerness of all childhoods. Dot, dot, dot. Addressing the child is always already queer. Maybe one of the uh, one way of supporting their imaginative inquiries about sexuality. So now we have to treat all kids like they're queer and address them as though they're queer and act as though they're queer to try to bring out the fact that maybe they are queer and to encourage them to explore whether or not they're queer. And again, we're talking about literally the rejection of identity. We're not talking, we're talking about, hey, understand yourself as gay. We're saying, no, you have to understand yourself as absolutely unstable in any identity. This is grooming identity disorders. Stockton, 2019, points out that the child and the homosexual have historically been positioned as oppositional, and so the consideration of queer childhood becomes categorically provocative. The schematizing of childhood innocence and mutual rhetorics of vulnerability in its exploitation have devalued the child's sexuality and ensured that the traumatized child is a figure hard to miss in most historical renditions of homosexuality. Groomers. The schematizing of childhood innocence and mutual rhetorics of vulnerability in its exploitation have devalued the child's sexuality. Groomers. You know, but let's take it seriously because ensure that the traumatized child is a figure hard to miss. Terrible. They're standing behind actually gay children who do have a challenge, or even maybe genuinely gender dysphoric children who do have a challenge and coming to grips with their identity. They're standing behind those, they're holding those, those poor kids out as human shields so that we can now say that we have to, you know, value the child's sexuality. 
No, we don't. We don't sexualize children and hide behind gay kids to do it. You nasty groomers who belong in prison. James Kincaid and Brum and Hurley show how an easy collapse of all childhood sexuality into definitions of trauma <laughs> an easy collapse of all childhood sexuality into definitions of trauma, in other words, rape, forecloses careful considerations of the child's agentic relationship to perverse and queer sexuality. The child has agency in wanting to be perverse and queer in their sexuality, but we class, we classify this just as trauma. We consider it a child abuse. How bad? These people are literally fucking groomers. It's disgusting. They belong in prison. This is what's happening to your children in government schools under brands like social emotional learning. Do you not get it? Their work, but we're just dress it back up in cute academic language where nobody can understand it and everything seems so scholarly and smart and the very smart people say, that oh, I can't possibly mean that. It's just this. Their work, like my own, is not interested in minimizing the corporeal or emotional impacts of sexual trauma experienced in childhood, but in understanding the possibility for children and youth to recruit amounts of bodily pleasure. You want that sentence to sink in? Their work, like my own, is not interested in minimizing the corporeal or emotional impacts of sexual trauma experienced in childhood. So well, let's nod to the fact that this is child abuse so that we don't get ourselves too deeply in trouble. But that's not the focus of our work. We're not going to ignore it, but that's not what we're really in. We're actually interested in understanding the possibility for children and youth to recruit amounts of bodily pleasure. Groomers. Early childhood education is what she's targeting with this. With them, I am sure that the child can be hurt by theories of precious innocence that punish curiosity and assume the child's status as victim. Why do you think there are books for grade school aged children under 10 years old teaching them about masturbation, teaching them about anal sex, teaching them about oral sex, teaching them about anal oral sex, aka rimming, licking buttholes? Let's just not mince words here. Why do you think that there is this rampant sexual literature here? Oh, because we have to be willing to acknowledge that sexual abuse can occur and that would be bad, but in these groomer books are valuable because we have to also be ready to have to, to understand the possibility for children and youth to recruit amounts of bodily pleasure. This is what they're doing to your children. This is sick. I'm going to go full Alex Jones and start yelling about Satanists before the end of this podcast, I swear. This literature does not elide or contest the psycho psychosocial damage done by molestation, rape, and other forms of child sexual abuse. Yes, it does. You're just saying that it doesn't. Yes, it does. You're actually encouraging this. Whoops, I skipped a sentence. With them, with them I'm sure the child can be hurt by theories of precious innocence that punish curiosity. Uh... The child can be hurt by theories of innocence, precious innocence, that punish curiosity and assume the child's status as victim. So you're, you can be hurt by ideas that sexualizing children is child, sexual child abuse, grooming. That's what she's saying. And then she says, this literature does not elide or contest the psychological damage done by molestation, rape, and other forms of sexual child abuse. Rather, it shows how making childhood sexuality a taboo subject is one way to protect the child's assumed proto-heterosexuality. If we, this is exactly what I told you in the previous podcast. Why are they trying to do this war against childhood innocence? Why? Because they believe that childhood innocence is a narrative constructed by people in power to maintain power, to keep it going. In this case, heteronormativity becomes the key thing or cis heteronormativity. And she says that making childhood sexuality a taboo subject is one way to protect the child's assumed proto heterosexuality, that they're going to grow into a heterosexual. This is so deranged. Queer theories of childhood are often brave in the ways that they wade into such taboo territory in order to show how what is considered perverse is often a mode of securing heteronormativity. Queer theories of childhood are often brave. Look how stunning and brave we are in the ways that they wade into the taboo territory, like grooming of children who will be sexually abused and emotionally abused into becoming trans and non-binary and not knowing who they are because they've been given an identity without an essence and had developmental psychology thrown out the window because, oh my God, in order to show how what is considered perverse is often a mode of making sure you'll grow up valuing uh, or thinking it's normal to be heterosexual. This is so disgusting. This is what they're doing to your children in public schools 
under the brand of social emotional learning. I'm going to keep saying that until you get it. Queer theory can be helped in its desires to prove that children are capable of possessing complexity and sexuality. Children are capable of possessing complexity and sexuality by exploring work done in the fields of early childhood studies and sociological studies of childhood. That's queer theory. That's what she says queer theory is about. This is because these fields and their associated methods of inquiry prioritize a child's possession of knowledge and agentic relation to the world. Halberstam's, it's a uh, trans queer theorist of great repute, 2011 theory of childhood tendered in the queer art of failure is an example of why queer theory might learn to appreciate these disciplines encounters with material children. Encounters with material children. That's disgusting. Although the text carries persuading examples of what can happen in the fecund import of philosophies on childhood to queer theory, Halberstam's depiction of childhood also relies on ideas of what children do and like, which seems a little too groundless and purposefully hollow. Quote, children do not invest in the same things that adult, in, adults invest in. Children are not coupled. They are not romantic. They do not have rom- a religious morality. They are not afraid of death or failure. They are collective creatures they are in a constant state of rebellion against their parents, and they are not the masters of their domain. That's a queer theorist, Jack or Judith, depending on when it was written, Halberstam's uh, summary of childhood. And this author's like, no, nah, that's way too simple. It's groundless and purposefully hollow because it relies on ideas of how children like that are not sufficiently developed. Queer theory needs to go further, she says, into grooming children sexually. And this is what they are teaching your children in government schools under the brand of social-emotional learning. A more thorough reading of the literature published in Childhood Studies may have demonstrated to Halbert Sam that children are, for example, afraid of death, demonstrate anxiety of social failure, and sometimes have great difficulty working with others. Halberstam's theory of children claims that they are not romantic, but in the queer art of failure, there's a romantic notion of childhood, in which a bi- this is a purposeful misunderstanding, by the way. Uh, there's a romantic notion of childhood in which a binary between childhood and adulthood is reified. Halberstam, to, to say that Halberstam doesn't know what, what he, he, she, they are talking about, Halberstam's theory of children claims that they are not romantic, but in Halberstam's book, there is a romantic notion of childhood. What does that have to do with children? Nothing. It's about the book. It's a complete subject shift. It's the kind of thing we would have put in our fake papers, our grievance studies papers, as a freaking joke. Like a purposeful miss, in, in non sequitur miss, in terms of linking one idea to another, in which a binary between childhood and adulthood is made real. There is a binary between childhood and adulthood. It's a little blurry in the adolescent phase, but that's why many societies in do, include rites of passage for growing up, whether it's a bar mitzvah or a bat mitzvah or whatever. In the Jewish tradition, there may be other ones later in early adulthood, college graduation or high school graduation would actually be one in our society that distinguish between, okay, you're no longer a child. It's time to put childish things away. Now you have to act as an adult. Uh, <laughs> there is. I mean, biologically, it's not a quick, close division, although there are some markers. Um, But there is a binary between childhood and adulthood, and we understand that there's this emerging adulthood and adolescent phase where it's it's a fuzzy line. But there's no difference between there's 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 no uh, there's no blurriness between an eight year old and a twenty five year old, or an eight year old and a thirty year old, or an eight year old and a fifty year old. It's perfectly obvious that they're very different things. This is there is a binary adulthood versus childhood. It's just blurry in the transition, a fuzzy line. And therefore, obviously, it's all nonsense to say that there's any difference at all. Thank you, queer theory. Trying not to think of the child as a site of pure resistance to normativity, as Halberstam arguably does, I am interested in what queer theory, while it lucratively continues to debate the terms on which the future is realized, can do when it is also interested in the quotidian lives of children and their structural differences. In the same vein, I've been asking what childhood studies could do differently if, as Robinson and Tobin appeal, it was more interested in queer theory, or at least queer affect, that circulates in spaces where children move. In the next section, I counter queer theories of childhood, 
such as Edelman, 2004, that empty the child of matters related to its physical embodiment in order to interrogate the forgetting of vital as, uh, vital evidence of children's remarkable experiences. I suggest that queer theory might be, or it might consider giving the child's body back in order to recognize the ways its form is animated by histories of race. So just to make sure we can really twist the knife and really turn turn the lever up, we're now going to say you're racist if you hold to ideas of childhood innocence. Just like I said in the previous podcast where I said they're doing the same thing in critical race theory. Well, here's the bridge. They're doing it in both together at the same time. Racialization and violence in queer theories of childhood. It's a section title. As Lee Edelman, 2004, states in No Future, Queer Theory and the Death Drive, our culture is obsessed with the child as the entity for which we build a future without conflict. For Edelman, the fantasy of the child is innocent futurity, and as the object for which sociality is organized, uh, disciplines... I'm sorry, I got the verbiage wrong there. For Edelman, the fantasy of the child is innocent futurity, and as the object for which society is organized, disciplines LGBTQ individuals. So in other words, um, because we care about raising children well, we exact a kind of socially imposed discipline on LGBTQ individuals to conform to, say, heteronormativity or whatever, cis-heteronormativity, and uh, that does injury to them. She says, in order to be legible and productive subjects in the social imaginary, we must be operative members of what he terms reproductive futurism. He explains, quote, queerness names the side of those not fighting for the children, the side outside the consensus by which all politics confirms the absolute value of reproductive futurism. In other words, wanting to have babies and thinking that's good. The cult of the child, she says, and cult of the child is in quotes here, signals an always ready impossible future to which queers are promised potential belonging if they uphold the contract of futurity, which assures that the culture is repeated without difference. So what she's saying is that there's a cult of the child. We care about children. We want children to grow up safe. We want children to grow up well. We want children to grow up, in fact, normal, healthy. And she says this, there's a cult, she says, around this, Iron Law of Woke Rejection, signals an always already impossible future. And she says queers can only be involved in this accepting future and they're promised belonging in it if and only if they uphold a social contract that we're going to keep being heteronormative that you're not going to rock the boat too hard that you're not going to have a queer revolution that sexual liberation is going to be limited and in fact kept out of children the reproductive body in the schematic becomes an emblem of achieved adulthood that signals the loss of childhood so your body becoming reproductively capable <laughs> becomes an emblem of adulthood. No, it, this is the definition of adulthood. There's a biological definition of adulthood that you can reproduce now. That's literally the biological definition of adulthood that signals the loss of childhood. Yeah, it's, when you become an adult, you can't keep acting like a child. You're fundamentally different. There is actually a binary there. I actually almost mentioned that earlier with the binary part we were talking about is that there actually is a binary. Are you, if you're a young woman, have you begun menses? Not that we should have teenagers procreating a lot, but that means that you're reproductively an adult. If you're a young man, are you producing uh, an ejaculating sperm? If so, then you are reproductively an adult. That does actually mark a biological difference. And granted, it's a little fuzzy, but only a little fuzzy at that point. And it does signal the loss of childhood. And that's why you see so many of these rites of passage in traditional cultures at the ages of 12 and 13 or thereabouts, Catholic confirmation, bar mitzvah, bat mitzvah, etc. Because those things, the, the separation between primary education and secondary education, because that actually does represent a fully uh, meaningful difference between children and adolescents, or, which are on track to being adults. There should be a rite of passage of some kind there. It, there should be a ritual in a sense that indicates it's not just that childhood is over for you, but you need to also let go of it. You need to now embrace the fact that you are reproductively an adult. They don't understand anything. They really don't. 
It's like they're aliens studying a sexually reproducing species for the first time, as Helen always says. She says, those who do not reproduce cannot be privileged in a symbolic order. Oh, so it all comes down to reproduction, and now we're back into missing the point on purpose through a word. Those who do not reproduce cannot be privileged in a symbolic order that celebrates life producing sex as paramount to contribution to humanity. So what she's saying is that if you're gay, because you're not going to be able to produce children reproductively with your chosen by a pair bonded life partner, if you're monogamous or mostly monogamous, because you're not going to reproduce, like two lesbians aren't going to make a baby. You can't possibly be privileged in a symbolic order, which is non, which means nonsense, that celebrates the idea of people making babies. This is such horrific nonsense. You want to talk about being absolutely homophobic. There's homophobia in a sentence that she's operating from a sen- from an assumption that those who not repro- those who do not reproduce cannot be privileged in a symbolic order that celebrates life producing sex as paramount to contribution to to humanity. And making babies is a contribution to humanity. That's in fact what ensures the continuity of humanity. The, the people are insane. So Edelman asks that we learn to find pleasure in sights and acts that do not secure a future. Okay, it's hedonism. Queerness for him is on the side of the death drive never finding solace and identity, only ever disturbing the social categories that try to make us legible to others. In other words, yes. Edelman is honest about what queerness is. It's on the side of the death drive, never finding solace and identity, only ever disturbing. And what is it disturbing, disrupting, dismantling, subverting, deconstructing social categories like gay, straight, etc. that make us legible, in other words, understandable to others. Oh, you're gay. I got you. I'm not going to hit on you anymore. Edelman's assertions are critical of liberal movements in queer communities toward replicating normative structures of kinship and progeny, which he understands as forlorn pleas for recognition from a culture that privileges those who secure repetition. I don't even want to break that down. I can. No baby, no future, and thus no sincere privileging in the symbolic or political world. Edelman hopes for a queer renouncement of loyalty to the child. A loyalty, he believes, rushes toward a future made of equality while ignoring the past and present conditions that create violence for LGBTQ uh, individuals and communities. Uh, Edelman hopes for a queer renouncement of loyalty to the child. Again, Marcuse has felt Marcuse's project was called the Great Refusal. The Great Refusal of Everything That Is, is what he defines that as. The, the, the protestation, he says, of everything that is. And so Edelman hopes for a queer renouncement of loyalty to the child, a loyalty he believes rushes toward a future made of equality. So we're going to get to equality. That'll be great, right? No, because it's going to ignore the past and present conditions that create violence for LGBTQ individuals and communities. In other words, there's not going to be reparations for past damage. This rush toward the child becomes, they're, they're symbol, symbolizing the idea of caring about children <laughs> as inherently LGBTQ oppressive and what the the source of LGBTQ oppression, because those are the relationships, heterosexual relationships are the ones that uh, are equipped to make children most of the time. So it's the child's fault. This is like this time, literally um, a a person (laughs) that I have in my family told me that I should be ashamed to have ever been born because I stole my father's youth by being born. It's the same argument. It's a psychotic. And by the way, that didn't bother me. I actually thought it was hilarious when I was told that because it's psychotic. It makes no sense. But that's the same thing, right? So this rush toward the child is a disavowal of the persistent hum of the death drive. So we have this constant death drive. And if we just... Um, rush toward the child. We're, we're just trying to avoid the idea of death by reproducing, by producing another child, by producing more, another generation. We're actually just trying to avoid the fact that we're going to die. They're so caught up in complicated theories of bullshit that they don't even understand the most basic things. Better, he thinks, to understand queerness as that which is destructive to the social order and in contradiction of reproductive futurity. Edelman capitalizes the child, capital C child, as a conceptual figuration, an effort to distance it from material embodied children. Edelman's work has not been taken up in a sustained way by the field of childhood education. And perhaps this is why. No, it's not why. It's because it's fucking psychotic. It's fucking anti-child. But you think it's, oh, because he capitalized child as a conceptual figuration instead of talking about actual children. No, they're so mentally ill on their own theory. 
His polemical texts cannot account for the queer, the child's queer existence, and although his provocations to the rhetoric of childhood innocence are sharp, they may be bettered by collaboration with scholarship that embraces the child's agency. Edelman now, Edelman's now seminal evocation of the child as innocent futur- futurity is not relational or able to hold space for a theory of flesh and blood children, and I will now discuss some of what is lost in its inability to account for the traumatic loss of statelessness, genocide, or war. Andrea Smith, 2010, in an essay on convergences and distrust between queer theory and native studies, responds to Edelman's production of a subjectless critique of childhood innocence. She posits that Edelman's anti-oppositional politics, and this is in quotes, Edelman's anti-oppositional politics in the context of multinational capitalism and empire ensures that the continuation of the status quo uh, by disabling collective struggle designed to dismantle these systems. But it's not communist. Smith's request that a theory of queer childhood makes room for recognition of the genocidal foundations of nation states in North America deepens my understanding of child's rights, child rights as contingent on relationality, nationality, and access to knowledge. Smith notes that what, quote, while Edelman contends that the child can be analytically separated from actual children, end quote, an indigenous critique of his text reminds us that in the context of genocide, quote, native peoples have already been determined by settler, settler colonialism to have no future. Long quote, if the goal of queerness is to challenge the reproduction of the social order, then the native child may already be queered. There you go, native. For instance, Colonel John Chivington, the leader of the famous massacre at Sand Creek, charged his followers not only to kill native adults, uh, I'm assuming it says by, but I assume it means but, to manipulate their reproductive organs and to kill their children because, quote, nits make lice. And so she's trying to tie the idea that we value children to the idea that we value our children of our own race most, and therefore that we need to genocide other races because there were assholes in the past who viewed races that way. And so the dialectic progresses. In this circumstance, the native child is not invested with assurance of futurity and cannot cohere in Edelman's privileged portrayal of the cult of the child. The native child for Smith is queered because it, quote, is not a guarantor of the reproductive future of white supremacy. It is the knit that undoes it, end quote. Smith makes her ambivalence toward Edelman's project clear. She finds, quote, the idea of reproductive continuity as homophobia, end quote, useful. However, she also makes it clear that she finds, quote, Edelman's analysis lapses into a vulgar constructionism. We've heard that before from Kimberly Crenshaw, haven't we? By creating a fantasy that there can actually be a politic without a political program that does not always reinstate what it deconstructs, that does not also in some way reaffirm the order of the same, end quote. So here we see the same intersectional turn happening, right? Just to make it clear, vulgar constructionism has to be replaced by critical constructivism that always sees the power dynamic as relevant to the construction of the social construction. She continues, quote, that is, it seems difficult to dismantle multinational capitalism, settler colonialism, white supremacy, and heteropatriarchy without some kind of political program, however provincial it may be, end quote. Smith invokes Jose Munoz in her assertion that, quote, relationality is not pretty, end quote, but is required in the context of genocide and its enduring violence. This is just normal critical theory insanity now. So bad things happened in the past. We can link them to this. We get a huge moral pull to take on all this crap. So now we have to sexualize children. That's the argument because otherwise somehow we're reproducing the genocide of Native Americans. That's what's happening here. These people are nuts. It's all just moral manipulation and emotional manipulation and terrible arguments to justify the pathology at the heart of this is that they want to groom children in government schools under the name social emotional learning. Your children. Edelman and Smith's texts help us to clarify that there's a dilemma in administering education and rights to material children while revising a theory of childhood that encompasses its queer dynamics. 
I trace Edelman's and Smith's conversation here with the aim of demonstrating the difficult necessity of making conceptual and figurative references to childhood relate to concerns about how material children are treated. After no future and attentive to Smith's critique, I wonder if and how thoughts surrounding childhood might be sufficiently queered so that it resists being constrained by normative developmentalism and productively challenges how national racial classed and gendered affiliations and identifications impact the distribution of rights and administration to education or of education to children. Holy smokes. Did you get all that? Um, normative development is developmentalism. So developmental psychology, as it actually describes human reality, uh, productively challenges the interrelated issues of national, racial, class, and gendered affiliations and identifications and challenges it at the level of uh, how rights are distributed differently to children depending on who they happen to be through an identity political, identity Marxist lens. This query, though related, is not accounted for in Edelman's polemic because he juxtaposes queerness to children. Although Edelman aims to deposit his critique in a post-political world, his analysis has been critiqued as an effort to elide collective narratives of struggle. So if you've ever heard my argument that, that critical theories only concentrate, that's a great example of what I'm talking about. The only kind of critique of a critical theory that's allowed is a further critical theory. So con critical theories only concentrate, they only get worse, and they only establish circular firing lines as a result. And this is something you must understand about it. No outside critique is considered to have engaged genuinely. So there is no possible critique of a critical theory that doesn't make it a worse critical theory. There's no critique that can exist that it will accept to uh, repair it. There is no limiting principle and there's no reparative principle that bring a critical theory back from the brink. They can only slide further down the slope. I did a podcast before. Every woke slope is slippery. This is why. In Cruising Utopia, the then and there of queer futurity, Jose Munoz, 2009, the revered queer theorist, offered a critique of Edelman's theory of childhood. Munoz revisited his own childhood to apprehend how he developed an understanding of himself as sexually non-normative. In the book, he recalls a moment where he learned his gender as shame, in which he felt queer and began to prudently conceal his difference. While reflecting on his own origins, he considers recent murders of queer, racialized youth in the United States to ask how thinking the child as only abstraction elides the impact of racism. This is just a, this is word salad. This is actually just a hodgepodge of ideas and buzzwords crammed together to make all of the intersectional levers get pulled as fast as possible in one place. Why? So he can groom children. Where? In government schools. Whose children? Your children. That's the point of all of this. So we have to talk about racism and blah, 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 and murders of queer youth and da, 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 da. So why? So they can continue to groom children. It's all just justification for their pathology. Munoz's book is in part a response to Edelman's polemical attempt to unfasten queerness from humiliated optimism and refuse compulsions to defer to the future. Against futurity, Edelman takes down the cult of the child in shrewd and deliberate jabs at breeders and futurists. Munoz, on a different path, points out that the child which Edelman builds as his thesis as target devalues the impact of structural disparities such as race, class, and gender. you got to make everything more intersectional, and so the dialectic progresses. Not all kids, as Munoz insists, are wanted in the future or receive the state's protection. Iron law of woke projection. This isn't even, nobody, in 2009, people did not think this way. Not all kids, he insists, are wanted in the future or receive the state's protection. This is BS. 2009. That's ridiculous. Iron law of woke projection. What he's doing is he's telling you there are lots of kids in the future that we don't want. The ones that are not us, not our political tribe. Here, he is. this is a genocidal language. Um, why do you think it's invoking genocide is the thing that you have to appeal to to say that we have to be able to sexualize children. Iron law of woke projection. Groomer edition. Here, he is allied with Andrea Smith. Tavia Nyong'o has made 2011 has made similar statements about how the rhetorical or the, how the rhetoric of innocence permits its own sorts of violence. To quote, "Black popular culture, with its painted awareness that privileges that the privileges of childhood are unequally distributed, has long held an ambivalent stance toward this dominant culture of the child. We could be as sentimental as anyone else about imagined childhood purity, but our 
culture also contains great reservoirs of skepticism toward the ideology of the child, whose vulnerability and value in American culture are so often restricted to the white child. There's your critical race theory nonsense. With the black child serving as a kind of foil, always ready, always already streetwise, tough, and precociously independent. Nobody thinks this way except these weirdos. And they only think this way because it's useful. They're using these people as props so that they can push their theory, which is ultimately Marxist, and so they can continue in their dark uh, agreement with the groomers to groom children sexually, so they can do all the damage that they need to do to create enough disaffected, alienated radicals that they're going to be able to have the revolution because all Marxist theories exist only to get to a revolution no matter how they have to do it, and they're going to pick at whatever scab they have to do to get there, whether it's economics, whether it's race, whether it's sex. Queer theories of childhood that do not account for histories of nation states, slavery, or genocide cannot help effectively cannot help effectively reimagine pedagogy of and for children. What does holding quote childhood and quote queer seemingly opposites and some kind of a productive tension achieve dialectical concepts? Some kind of productive t- tension achieve if cannot also consider the devastating effects of racialism of racism and colonialism. So here we're distracted thinking about racism and colonialism, but the point about queer theory is now all of a sudden we have to consider queerness and childhood as dialectical concepts that must somehow be sublated. You must somehow find put them into collision and come up with a, synth- a synthesis. Children made to be queer, just like Rousseau had savages made to live in cities. It's the same master-slave dialectic that inspired Hegel to name his entire program dialectic, which inspired Marx to call his program dialectical materialism, which inspired the neo-Marxists to get back to the dialectic, which inspired all of these theorists to talk about how the dialectic progresses, dialectical, dialectical, dialectical. So here we're tucked into this statement about racism and colonialism. We have, what good is it to recognize that queerness and childhood are dialectical concepts in opposition to one another in productive tension? productive tension, the attempt to make queer children. Children meant to be queered. That's their goal. Where? Government schools. Who? Your children, under the brand name of social emotional learning, primarily at the moment. That will change when this gets exposed. Keep your eyes open. Comprehensive sex education, etc. The It Gets Better social media campaign, as summarized below, offers an account of queer futurity that does not carefully attend to the corrosive force of racism and its colonial antecedents, so we have to problematize it gets better. It doesn't even get into racism. It's about, it's not even about race. It's about, or colonialism, Jesus. It's about, it gets, listen, don't kill yourself if you're a gay kid. You're going to grow up and understand yourself better. That's the point of it gets better. Nope, got to problematize it. It does not even carefully attend to the corrosive force of racism and its colonial antecedents or the way that social class can erode one's ability or desire to transgress the location in which they are embedded. Transgress the location. That means, in other words, um, to have a revolution. Making childhood education, quote, get better. In 2010, an American initiated through international, though internationally responded to, a social media campaign, It Gets Better. It was created to show children and adolescents that it's okay to be gay because a kinder future hangs in the wings. It Gets Better is full of advice on how to turn out gay, which in 1991 Cedric pointed out was not. Meaning to show, meant to show, I should say, young LGBTQ people that there is a future beyond mandatory schooling where homophobia can feel stifling and constant. It Gets Better is a strategy to prevent the high rate of suicide among this population. Sounds not that bad, right? Initiated by Dan Savage, a white American media person, and they named him white, you know, he's a bad guy. Dan Savage is actually very liberal, and Dan Savage came up with this program and a lot of other things that are, it's worth engaging with Dan Savage's research, whether you, and ideas, whether you like him or not, whether you agree with him or not. He is a thoughtful person who's put some, put forth some very good ideas, and it gets better as a very good idea. Uh, He's very real. You may disagree with his conclusions, you may disagree with who he is, whatever, but he's put forth some very good ideas. And you can tell because they hate him because they call him a white American media personality and author. They didn't call him a researcher. They didn't call him anything. No, white American media personality and author. I always got to throw that little bit of slight. We're scholars. You're a turd. Initiated by Dan Savage, a white American media personality and author and his husband, Terry Miller, it gets better began with a YouTube narrative in which 
The men describe how their lives improved after school and when they became adults. Savage says that because it was unlikely that the schools would allow him to speak about sexuality to children, he used social media, quote, to speak directly to LGBTQ kids. The very format of It Gets Better Then is informed by a knowing assumption that children's schools will be resistant to discussing non-normative and queer sexuality. Notice that that implicitly questions whether or not that's okay. In fact, they want to groom children. So they want non-normative and queer sexuality to be centered in schools. They've already said so. And so, you know, their point is the whole campaign is saying, well, we're, we're not going to talk to kids about sex in schools. We're going to talk to them in other ways. We're going to form other mentorship type relationships. And I detect nothing so far in any of my engagement with Dan Savage's work that I, I have no reason I would ever say, okay, groomer to him that I'm aware of. Um, but these people want to be groomers in government schools of your children. The campaign became a widespread phenomenon and sparing 50,000 user-created videos. This is going to remind you, by the way, of the walkaway program, if you're politically active, that Brandon Straka, also a gay man, did. Um, inspiring 50,000 user-created videos and 50 million views. Oh no, look how much social impact they're having. Oh no, Foucauldian power dynamics. Oh no, the discourses. This thing that's not queer enough, that's not and also apparently racist and whatever. This thing that didn't engage the way that we wanted to engage because it didn't have the conclusions we wanted to have. It had 50 million views with 50,000 videos. Oh no, that's what they're concerned about is that other messages than theirs are going to not only get out, but be influential. Quickly, the internet became populated with digital narratives of queer adults self-described resilience in the face of discrimination. We can't have that. Oh no. What can exist in the aftermath of heterosexual failure is, according to It Gets Better, potentially livable, even desirable. So you're going to, it's going to be tough. The message might be you're going to, but you're going to be stronger because of it. You're going to come out good. It gets better. You're going to have a great life once you get to be an adult and you understand what you, what this is. And it's actually not going to be the end of the world. Nope. Can't have that message. That's the thing the queer theorists have to turn down. It has to constantly alienate. You have to groom the children constantly so they feel constant alienation, so they want to reject the existing society. This is Herbert Marcuse's program, re-filtered through queer theory. It's very, very, very clear when you understand them. In relation to my concern for the seemingly innocuous but effective damaging impacts of normative theories of childhood development is a consideration of how the advice provided in this campaign does not evenly support queer children and youth. Here we go. The campaign has been highly critiqued, probably by like queer activists only, for its inadequate consideration of how race and class, for example, are elided in Savage's and Miller's characterization of overcoming homophobia. Yeah, because they actually are other variables. Race and class are not actually relevant variables to homophobia and overcoming it. Uh, Asian gay, a uh, black gay, a white gay, a uh, Latino gay, they're all in the same boat in terms of struggling with homophobia. But no, 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 we got to criticize. We have to go intersectional. We have to shoot down Savage and Miller. We have to destroy their work because it doesn't have the queer conclusion that we want. That's the game of this game. And the queer conclusion that they want is they want to be able to groom children, your children, in government schools under the brand of SEL. A contentious dialogue among queer theorists and the people who actually fought back against them. A contentious dialogue surrounding Savage's project has surfaced. This is, you know, these same people can complained when Trump was like, people are saying, and then he said something true uh, so that he could avoid having seemed to have said it himself. Same thing. There's a contentious dialogue. No, you guys are creating a big, they, they go out, they start an argument and they say there's a contentious dialogue. There's not. There's freaks yelling and some people yelling back at them. There's not a contentious dialogue. This is a form of activism that they use on purpose. Learn to see the signs. A contentious dialogue surrounding Savage's project has surfaced, spurred by divergent approaches to queer futurity. There's a growing amount of activist response and allied scholarly publications that both critique the campaign for its shortcomings and sort through the psychological conditions which have compelled so many to participate in it. Freeze. What's happening here? Savage offers a message of resilience. It becomes very popular. Queer theorists freak out. So they create a huge stink. People argue with them about it as they will. And they say there's a contentious dialogue and a growing amount of activist response and allied scholarly publications to attack this thing. In particular, the psychosocial conditions which have compelled so many to participate in it. So now they're going to say there's this system of normalcy and normativity that's compelling people, this desire to be accepted, that's 
stabilizing the class so they won't become revolutionaries anymore. They literally are mad about a message of resilience for people who could arguably be said to be experiencing a more difficult and even unjust situation. They are mad about a message of resilience, exactly like Paolo Freire said that the point isn't to help people learn to be independent when they discover their dependence, but rather to resent their state of dependency and the people who create it and become revolutionaries in the pedagogy of the oppressed. This is the entire mentality, exactly like how uh, Marcuse's argument isn't that we should celebrate the stabilized working class, we should be angry that they became a counter-revolutionary force, and we should agitate the other groups, whether it's racial minorities, sexual minorities, feminists, etc., outsiders, unemployed, so that they will become radicals. The goal is to create radicals to have a revolution because it's a Marxian theory. It's not to solve any problems. They are literally critiquing a message of resilience that was extremely popular and probably did a lot to damage the problem of gay suicides, teenage suicides. It probably helped a lot. And this is the exact same thing they invoke, these sick, sick hypocrites. They say, oh, well, we have to groom children in schools because otherwise kids will commit suicide. Here we have a message of resilience that actually worked. And like, no, 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 not resilience. No, 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 bad, 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 No resilience, no resilience, no resilience. He's white, he's white, he's white. He didn't even engage with racism. He's white, he didn't talk about colonialism. What about Native Americans? Oh my God, he's bad. Resilience, no. That's queer theory. That's queer theory. Look at how they're going after him. Many critics insist, many critics, many critics, I'm sure, like all 29 queer theorists who lost their minds over this, insist that the psychic and corporeal survival that is nurtured in dreams of a future that holds smaller amounts of homophobia and gendered violence should not trump considerations of race, gender, disability, and other markers of difference. Quick, problematize, go to other, go to other, other identity categories, find another mass line of action to problematize, quick, ruin, 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 a message of resilience, oh no. Seriously, that's what's happening here. Why? So they can continue to use government schools to groom your children sexually and politically under a brand name of social emotional learning. Jasbir Puar, 2010, suggests that, quote, Savage's IGB, It Gets Better video is a mandate to fold into urban neoliberal gay enclaves, a form of liberal handholding and upward mobility. (laughs) So you're going to become a functional member of society who is accepted as such, and that's terrible. Poir appropriately asks, quote, but how useful is it to imagine troubled gay youth might master their injury and turn blame and guilt into transgression, triumph, and all-American success? That's what they're against? It gets better. Aims to repair a world broken by homophobia's injuries, but its liberal underpinning is devastating and its inability to submit that maybe things don't get better, but we learn to live in the wreckage of queer damage. This is exactly the same argument that Marcusa gives about the working class being stabilized and everybody's having a good life, but don't they realize there could be communist utopia? And it's also a statement of, of the other aspect of the Iron Law of Woke Projection. We are listening to the pathologies of somebody who doesn't know how to live with themselves or imagines other people not being able to live with themselves by proxy. Its liberal underpinning is devastating in its inability to submit that maybe things don't get better. You literally have the testimonies, the lived experience testimonies of 50,000 gay people saying it gets better. But you're going to throw all that out because it's the wrong political message, wrong kind of gay, not queer. So instead of things getting better, they submit, we learn to live in the wreckage of queer damage. No, you don't know how to deal with the fact that your life got better and that we aren't all going to be revolutionaries and that we actually do want acceptance generally and a stable society and all of what is it <laughs> turn blame and guilt into transgression triumph and all Amer- american success yes we want all american su- success we actually want all american success we want upward mobility we want a functioning society but no they want to live in the wreckage of queer damage so they want to bring this to as many children as possible your children where in government schools how through grooming under a brand name of social emotional learning as a case study It Gets Better offers a valuable and complex examination of how LGBTQ identities get 
to get sutured to and evicted from educational settings, and how expanding the terms of queerness to analyze a contemporary residue of colonialism and slavery in the United States and Canada, for example, is necessary. Such bullshit. A major criticism of It Gets Better is that it does not aim to correct injustice in the contemporary moment or increase resilience toward oppression within schools, but postpones better feelings to the achievement of adulthood. Bless. The campaign could be improved by a thoughtful commitment to reducing homophobia and heteronormativity as it occurs in the present in childhood educational settings. I don't think you're going to find that anybody actually disagrees with that. Any normal, reasonable person would agree with that. The ideal situation would be that there is no uh, bullying of this kind happening in schools or injury of this kind happening with children. But the fact of the matter is, life's not always so neat and clean. You can't actually end all terrible things. And at some point, you actually end up going into force and creating more terrible things, like grooming children uh, and breaking lots of things because you think you can save something that can't actually be saved. The campaign could be improved by a thoughtful... I already said that part, sorry. Although the primary impulse of It Gets Better was a response to queer youth suicide and feelings of distress made from sexual difference, the application of its resultant cultural criticism to the field of childhood studies and early childhood education provokes a deeper understanding of what is at stake when children are not supported in queer explorations of sexuality. P.S in government schools by groomers. The campaign and its ensuing critiques admit that queer affect and homophobic damage circulate in classrooms and site of education and are thus valuable to a reworking of curricula and pedagogy for children. Tavia Nyango reminds us that It Gets Better was a response to the trouble which arises when queerness enters the site of education. Its message insists that surviving school is possible. How terrible. In response to the campaign, Nyong'o has written that, I think there is a bit of queer salvific salvific wish going on. I don't know why it's there twice. I think it should only be there once. This thing is actually full of typos, so you've probably heard a few other ones. Um, scholarship in the 21st century in queer theory. I think there is a bit of queer salvific wish going on in the It Gets Better videos, which exhibits a similarly melancholic refusal to work through the grief that might come with a recognition that it doesn't get better. Again, broken, broken, broken. And we all have to live in their psychopathologies rather than embracing a message of resilience and telling people, look, you know, you were born a particular way and it's not necessarily just, and we want to try to do the most we can to fix this. But in a sense, at least for the moment, we have Draw, you have drawn a short stick and um, don't let that get you down. We're going to keep working for a better future. We want you to be a part of that. So definitely realize, first of all, don't kill yourself. But second of all, there's a message of resilience and triumph here that you can embrace called It Gets Better. And we want you to do that. And you can, you know, together as we go forward, embracing incrementalism and step by step progress, not only can you live a more fulfilling life, but you can take what you learn in the process and apply it to ameliorating this problem in a realistic way rather than a completely reckless revolutionary way. Uh, and this is what the queer theorists don't like. He continues, quote, maybe the secret truth is that we were that we repress is that school sucks even when we find a way to make it work for us. This reminds me actually of when I read the kind of mathematics stuff, the the ethno-mathematics, and like literally there's the authors are writing like, I was terrible at school, school sucks, blah, blah, blah. Uh, sorry about your luck. I mean, I don't know what to tell you. Maybe the secret truth that we repress is that school sucks even when we find a way to make it work for us, end quote. Nyong'o's suggestion that school could be better that it's not enough to daydream of a future in which the student's desires may be realized, might inspire early childhood educators to construct a more welcoming environment for the child who is growing sideways, as Stockton may deem it. Considering it gets better, besides Minot's, Nyong'o and Smith's arguments remind us that the psychic machinations at work and the, and the adult's compulsion to suggest that the world holds less amounts of homophobia for adults are resultant of a refusal to recognize the uneven distribution of justice and rights to children in the present. So basically what's actually not being recognized here is with school sucks or whatever. What's actually being repressed is that children are assholes to each other. They are. 
it's very beautiful. They're, they're, they're supposed to be criticizing the narrative of childhood innocence, but children are little assholes to each other. They bully the crap out of each other. They 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 are quite rude. People, it's really vicious um, in a lot of cases. And there's going to be. I don't think you can stop the stop bullying. And so their solution then to the problem, which this of course is a perennial problem, their solution to this problem of you know. Unsu- insufficiently developed children being rude to each other that they grow out of their solution to this problem of kind of the cruelty of of a underdeveloped prefrontal cortex is sexualize all children and question the idea of developmental psychology entirely including sexualizing your children in government schools which is going to do massive amounts of damage we know for example this is not a joke we know for example that schizoid personality disorder often arises specifically from the condition that a romantic or sexual relationship that is developmentally inappropriate is impressed upon a child usually between the ages of like seven and ten it causes personality disorders and i've told you critical theories exist to induce personality disorders so here we're going to do it straight to kids through sexualization of them to summarize, it gets better. The it gets better campaign, I should say, is an effort to assure LGBTQ children and youth that their future will hold less violence. As Minos, Poir, Nyango, and Smith demonstrate, though, the future is not as kind to those whose bodies are imprinted with the legacies of colonialism or transatlantic slavery, for example. So what this is a tacit admission that they're right, you know. It does get better when you're when you're an adult and we have this very, you know, liberal society that is very tolerant now, very accepting now. Uh, it does get better if you're gay or lesbian or bisexual or trans or queer. It does get better when you're an adult and people are understanding and, and get it and you can communicate and talk these things through. It does get better. It actually does get better. The resilience actually works. That's what they're saying. Because that's why they have to say, well, it, not for all kids, though. Not for those whose bodies are imprinted with the legacies of colonialism or transatlantic slavery, for example. The queer theory of childhood, they have to invoke other identity categories because the problem doesn't exist. They're actually wrong and they're admitting that they're wrong. So they have to invoke other identity categories so they can keep doing the thing that they're actually admitting that they're wrong. These are intellectual swindlers. They are literally con artists using a bunch of complicated gobbledygook to pull their con. And what's the result of their con? What's their goal? To continue to groom children in government schools. Your children groomed into sex in government schools, completely age inappropriately, which they also admit because their target is developmental psychology. The queer theory of childhood that I have been proposing would not find the campaign a suitable, it gets better campaign, a suitable intervention because it does not address the present conditions in which children live and learn. So it's not completely radical. It's not a revolutionary ideology. It is a liberal ideology that can create real meaningful progress incrementally and in steps. No, instead we have to have the revolution that's going to be controlled by these freaks who want to groom your children in government schools. They think they own your children. So of course they want to do that. And all they think about is grooming into sex children to the point where they're like developmental psychology is a hegemonic narrative that we should reject and queer so that we can continue to groom children in government schools. Who's yours, your children. In their schools that you trusted people not to groom children into second sexuality. It's so important to really get what's going on here. I keep saying it. I really mean it. These people belong in fucking prison. The analytic possibilities made conceivable by theories of the child's queer existence can only offer a better future if they turn back toward colonial pasts. Nonsense. In my attempt to address homophobia's impact on childhood development, I have hoped to queer the damaging rhetoric of childhood innocence, that's their target, by suggesting that we as adults clear a path for children to symbolize negativity, queer affect, and sexual curiosity. Yeah, we as adults should make kids sexually curious and queer. How? By making sure that they don't stay innocent. We have to question that. We have to destroy it. Why? Because it's a damaging narrative, like I told you in schools of grooming episode one because for queer theory gender and sexuality are porous and mobile a queer theory of childhood education should not be invested in predicting the child's future identity but rather attend to the child's present curiosity about sexual difference i spent time with edelman's and halberstam's theories of childhood to show that the limitations arise when queer theories of childhood cannot bear the weight of the material child conclusion toward a queer future for childhood studies in other words we're going to 
the goal was we're going to take it's better it gets better we're going to problematize that and anything we're going to keep from it we have to queer everything else we've early childhood development uh psychology we have to queer early childhood education we have to queer now it's we're going to queer childhood studies toward a queer future for childhood studies it's always twist the ratchet in the direction of the ideology this is an ideological colonization project all of the critical theories are ideological colonization projects they're attempting to colonize every possible aspect of society culture and institutional uh apparatus so that they can become uh organs of the ideology it's a takeover an ideological takeover in other words marxism a theory of the child by way of detour through queer theory can help to clarify the damage done when children's curious investigations of sexual difference and agentic responses to structures of social violence are punished. There is, on the one hand, the necessity of supporting LGBTQ children, and on the other, the related need to reimagine our theories of childhood so that they are not constrained by rhetorics of childhood innocence that invalidate the child's potential queer desires. <sighs> I've traced some of the convergences and antagonisms between the disciplinary fields of queer theory and the sociological studies of childhood education in order to assist in cementing a methodological bond between child studies and queer theory. In other words, to make child studies a arm of queer theory. Familiarity with debates about childhood in queer theory spun out of adult opinions on what the future should hold and how innocence should be distributed may help childhood educators to better support LGBTQ children, but also more broadly remap theories of childhood development so that all children can be better supported in their curious and creative resistances to injustice. I have advocated that our adult theories of childhood are compelled by our adult affective, remembered, and unconscious experiences with education, family, and sexuality. In other words, they're hegemonic and they're artificial. Uh, experiences with education, family, and sexuality, and underwritten by histories of race, because we've just got to throw the whole kitchen sink in there, of course. Strengthening a conceptual relation between queer and childhood. Remember, that's going to be a dialectical synthesis. Children made to be queer can help to cultivate a culture of critique concerning the interruptive force of heteronormativity on the child's development and more broadly expose asymmetries and how children are treated and the rhetoric of innocence is distributed. Queer theories of childhood may operate as analytics with which to make arguments about social relations between children and the adult world to which they must respond, and in so doing, invite questions about the embodied vulnerabilities, educational effects, neurological impacts, and narrative implications of discourses of childhood innocence. Good to remember in the context of all those fancy words that they still want to sexualize children. Whose, yours, where, their schools. A vast majority of research on childhood development resuscitates liberal individualism as it does not consider the sociality of pain caused by the communal experience of violence wrought under racism and genocide. Just throw those in there because building a queer theory of childhood may be a project in which histories of race and racialization are better understood for their continued impact on schooling and education, outlining an emergent discourse at the intersection of early childhood education, sociological studies of education, and queer theory. I have sought to broaden queer theory's angle of analysis to include a consideration of the material child who must live through childhood. This collaborative formation can, I suggest, be a space in which methodologies and concomitant practices of childhood education can be made better. So that's this psychotic paper that frames out what they want to do in order to continue grooming children into sex in schools. This is what's happening in reality. This is the kind of paper that, that backs it up. They are grooming children into queer sexuality in order to, in the very Rousseauian, Hegelian, Marxian frame, make children who are made to be queer by grooming them in our schools. And this is a robust, if you will, defense of that from the perspective of queer theory so that you can understand what's actually happening. So in the previous episode where I talked about the grooming schools that we now face with the various graphic novels, and I talked about the links to, to Lukács' program 100 years ago in Hungary and in the Eastern Bloc and the, the birth of the Frankfurt School and how this manifested clearly in Marcusa, and here we hear tons of echoes to Marcusa. Um, we see a very long, that's what I'm saying is I'm, I'm right. There was a guy that I was in grad school with that was a little bit quirky. He died actually. Um, he was a little quirky ultra weirdo genius. And one time he was going through some very complicated things in real analysis with us, uh, trying to 
because he was very good at it and he was trying to tutor us up before our real analysis qualifying exam. And um, he would write these complicated things and he'd say, so the blah, 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 you know, whatever the analytic, da, 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 some complicated math statement. And then at the end of every sentence, he would say, I'm right. So at the end of this podcast, I look back to my previous podcast and I say, I'm right. I'm right. I actually called that guy. I'm right. Cause I couldn't ever remember his name. Cause he was like Ukrainian or Russian or something. He had a long name that's that I, I struggled with. And so I actually referred to him as I'm right. And then, uh, I'm right died. Uh, so I look back at my previous podcast. I'm right. The, the project in our schools is to groom children into a Marxist, um, a Marxist destabilization project at the level of their identity that is being facilitated by groomers who are kind of in a symbiotic uh, relationship with the uh, theorists, with the Marxists, uh, and the the negative externality of this agreement and project is your kid, your kids, and their psychological well-being and their ability to get to know themselves and grow into a healthy, mature adult, which now has to be queered, and their stability in understanding themselves as a sex, gender, and sexual identity, which has to be queered, and probably the, the psychological, emotional, and even physical and sexual well-being, which will be exploited in more cases than we even want to think about by groomers who are you going to take advantage of that situation. And I mean actual pedophile groomers. This is what's happening. And again, just to say one more time, this is what's happening to your children in our government schools with your tax dollars under brand names like comprehensive sex education and social emotional learning. This is an emergency. This is why I said, as I said in the previous episode of the podcast, this is why I said if a couple of months ago that I was going to turn away from critical race theory and turn to this. This is why I said, one of the reasons that I said, there are more reasons that I said that I fully understand why Alex Jones gets so pissed off because when you start thinking about what this really is and what's really going on, it does, you, you, I'm sorry about what this episode is going to do to people. It's going to make you so fucking mad when it connects with you, what's actually happening, why it's happening, and that it's intentional. And this is why our schools have to be absolutely purged. What can you do? You must form a parent's coalition. You must set aside all your differences as parents and fight for your children. It doesn't matter if it's a Republican mom or a, or a Democrat mom. Republican, Democrat doesn't mean anything. They're grooming your children and sexually abusing them, psychologically abusing them so they can sexually abuse them, so that they can destabilize them, so that they can have a red guard, so that they can have a cultural revolution, so they can achieve whatever program they have as some other kind of revolution because it's a Marxist theory your children, Republican, Democrat, right, left, center, white, black, Latino, Asian race doesn't matter. Political doesn't matter. Vaxxed, unvaxxed doesn't matter. None of it matters. None of it matters. Religions don't matter. Christian, atheist, Buddhist, Jew, uh, Muslim, doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. Parents, your parents, your parents, your parents and your children are being wrecked by this crap having dominated our schools. You must understand this. You must create a coalition that transcends partisanship, that transcends identity in every single category except parent. Parent who cares about your children, you must understand this. You must do this. You must fight back as one unified voice of parents who want to clean this crap and all the other stuff that doesn't belong out of our schools. It's so, so, so important. I hope these two podcasts help you understand. I hope these two podcasts help you become motivated. If they've made you very angry, I encourage you to sit with that, think about it, and channel it in very productive ways. Begin to organize, share the information, get together, get organized, start cleaning this out by every legal means, because it's so important. And it, it, it's our kids. It's our kids. It's our kids and therefore it's our future, but it's our kids. That's all I've got to say. <laughs>